give everybody just a minute to take their seat. Let me give everybody just a lay of the land. So I do appreciate that you're wearing your mask. We would ask you to do that when you're speaking. Uh, we would say it's fine to take it off. Although you're mostly socially distanced, because we have more than 10 people in the room, we would appreciate you keep your mask on unless you're speaking. Or so, eating. Or eating. Or, or, or eating. Or eating. But who's going to do that, right? So, before we begin the meeting today, we want to conduct a swearing-in ceremony for our newly appointed student regent. First, let me welcome and introduce you to Ms. Brooke uh, Walterscheid. As most of you may recall, Brooke served as the SGA president for the Texas Tech Health Sciences Center in 2018 and 2019. Brooke graduated from Texas Tech University in 2016, earning a degree in cell and molecular biology with a minor in chemistry in the College of Arts and Sciences. She graduated magna cum laude with the highest honors from the Honors College. She was the top graduate in the Rawls College of Business in 2017, earning a Master's of Business Administration from Texas Tech's Graduate School with a concentration in STEM. Brooke is currently a fourth year medical student at Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center. We're very fortunate to have such an outstanding student and leader as part of our team. Congratulations, Brooke. You're welcome. We're glad to have you join the Board of Regents. We'll now conduct the swearing in ceremony, and Vice Chairman Lewis will administer the oath of office. Mr. Lewis. Good morning. In the name of the authority of the state of Texas, please repeat after me. I, Brooke Walkershaw. I, Brooke Walkershaw. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully execute. That I will faithfully execute. The duties of the office. The duties of the office. Of the Board of Regents of the Texas Tech University System. Of the Board of Regents of the Texas Tech University System. Of the state of Texas. Of the state of Texas. And will. And will. To the best of my ability. To the best of my ability. Preserve. Preserve. Protect. Protect. And defend the Constitution and law. Of the United States and of this state. Of the United States and of this state. So help me God. So help me God. <laughs> here. 
you're in this position to serve students, especially as this is my eighth, yes, eighth and final year as a student. I know my parents are very excited about the prospect of me having a real job in a year. It's been a minute. Um, but as for now, I am ready and willing to put in the work to serve students um, and to ensure for them that we're here it truly is possible. very much for your willingness to serve on the board. So I have the unusual opportunity here not, I, I'm, I'm not able to call our meeting to order until 9.30, so we have a five minute uh, sit down here uh, before we begin. So uh, Mr. Chairman, you do have the opportunity to do the any motions and recognitions. So uh, let, let's, let's move along then. So I'm not going to call the meeting to order uh, let me skip down to, um, I'm going to skip down to item A, and what I'm going to do is call on Chancellor Mitchell, Interim President Wright, President Skubanek, and President Lane, President Rice Spearman, if you'll present your introductions and recognitions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I, I was actually going to tell a story to kill the time. Perfect. Ah. A true story. Yeah, a true, a true story. Yes, sir. You know, with everything, everything that's going on in education right now, there was this, this young girl that was going back to school, and uh, they were talking about different animals in the kingdom, and they were talking about whales. And uh, the young lady asked the teacher, said, well, uh, how is it that a whale can swallow a human being? And the teacher said, well, a whale can't swallow a human being. And she said, well, yes, of course a whale can swallow a human being. I know the story of the whale. There you go. And the I don't, said, well, I don't care whether a whale can swallow a human being. And the little girl said, well, you know what, when I go to heaven, I'm just going to ask Jonah about myself. And she said, well, what if Jonah went to hell? And then the little girl like her, looked at her and said, well, then you ask him. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, two introductions. First, we will start with Mr. Ben Lott. Ben, stand up. Where's Ben? There he is. So Ben, is, uh, ben needs no introduction, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about him. Ben has been a pillar of dedication and service not only to the Texas Tech University system and to the Texas Tech University, but also to the state of Texas. Uh, ben is originally from Lufkin, Texas. He is a Lufkin Panther. He worked for then Senator John Monfort of the Texas Senate and joined him in Lubbock when uh, Chancellor Monfort became the first chancellor of the newly formed Texas Tech University system in 1996. Ben has worked with all five chancellors and countless regents and was here when the system was first started. As you know, Ben has served in a part-time role in the Board of Regents office since he announced his retirement a year ago. He's been extremely helpful uh, for Kano McQuinney as Kano begins his tenure as the Secretary of the Board of Regents. As Ben officially retires from our family here at the system, uh, he will become full-time with his family and his grandchildren, which I know he is excited about. One of the things that I asked Ben in his last review was, what did he want to do from a personal standpoint, he said he wants to spend more time fishing with his grandkids. Uh, ben and his wife Robin have two daughters, both of whom hold bachelor's and master's degrees from Texas Tech and the Health Sciences Center. Both live in Lubbock. Ben and Robin have four grandchildren, which call him Paul, a nickname coming from Ben and Robin's oldest son, Carson. Congratulations, oldest grandson, Carson. Congratulations to Ben on a remarkable career in the state of Texas and with the Texas Tech University system. Thank you for all your hard work and efforts over the years. Next, I'd like to recognize Regent Ginger Carrick. It's a little bit unusual. Uh, because everybody knows Regent Care, uh, but there's something special that she deserves some recognition for at this meeting. Regent Carrick is the Deputy Director of the Exploration, Integration, and Science. astronauts launched from American soil, and the first time in history that they were aboard a commercially owned and operated spacecraft. 
This is truly a huge accomplishment, and we are all so proud of the work that Regent Carrot has done to create this historic milestone. You're a shining example of our motto, from here it's possible. Join me in congratulating Regent Ginger Carrot. <laughs> Next, I would like to recognize Ms. Angie Wright. I'd like to thank Angie for her service as the interim president of Angela State University, a position she has served since April of this year. Angie did an outstanding job maintaining the positive momentum of the university and did some truly heavy lifting to lead the university through the coronavirus pandemic. As an Angela State alum, Angie has been a member of the Ram Fan for more than three decades. We are thankful for her leadership, expertise, and dedication to her alma mater and fortunate to have Angie back in service as her role as Chief Financial Officer. Later this month, she will pass the baton to Lieutenant General Ronnie Hawkins, who will be named the 11th President of Angel State University. Angie, thank you for all your dedication. Please join me in the next <laughs> And finally, I'd like to introduce everyone to retired Lieutenant General Ronnie Hawkins, Jr. How are you? General. Other children. And uh, two weeks ago, the Board of Regents announced Lieutenant General Ronnie Hawkins Jr. as the sole finalist for the Angelo State University 11th President. Ronnie is an ASU alumnus, a three star Air Force general, and a lifelong scholar and internationally respected leader. On Monday, August 17th, the day that Angelo State begins its fall semester for the upcoming academic year, General Hawkins will officially be announced and appointed as the 11th president in the 92-year history of Angelo State University. This is a homecoming for Ronnie and the ASU community, as Ronnie and his family moved to San Angelo in 1969 when his father was serving in the military at Goodfellow Air Force Base. General Hawkins is a graduate of San Angelo Central High, where he met his high school sweetheart and wife of 46 years, Maria. Ronnie graduated from Angelo State, where he received a track and field scholarship and was in the ROTC program. And in fact, was one of the first car scholarship uh, recipients. From there, he began what he thought would be a three to five year career in the Air Force, but it wound up being a 37 year career in the US Air Force, which culminated in appointment as the Director of the Defense Information Systems Agency in Fort Meade, Maryland. He's a recipient of the, uh, the, the Bronze Star and the Legion of Merit from the U.S. Air Force. During that appointment, Ronnie led a $10 billion global organization of 14,000 military and civilian personnel and provided direct support to the United States President, the U.S. Secretary of Defense, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, combatant commanders, combat commanders, uh, Department of Defense Components, and other mission partners. Following his career in the military, Ronnie served as president and CEO of the Hawkins Group, a digital information technology and cybersecurity services firm based in San Angelo, Texas. Throughout his career, Ronnie's dedication to learning and higher education has been nothing short of exemplary. As he has earned three master's degrees and completed a program for senior managers in government from Harvard University. A few years ago, Ronnie returned to the classroom where he taught a course at ASU in leadership development for a few semesters. His entire career has been full of awards and accomplishments, including three times being named a distinguished alum. He is a leader of the highest integrity and character, provides Angela State University great stability at a crucial point in the institution's history. I know I speak for many, many folks when I say we greatly look forward to naming Ronnie Hawkins Jr. as the 11th president of Angela State University. Please join me in welcoming General Hawkins to the grand <laughs> Mr. Chairman, if I might, General Hawkins, you'll notice that the Chancellor asked you to stand up and it was a rather turt response, you know. This won't be the last time you have to get used to taking some orders, apparently. <laughs> I just like it because I was three. Yeah, three. that's right. And, uh, and fortunately, there was enough social distance where your response was going to be a little difficult. Anyway. <laughs> Welcome.
need to take this role. It was pretty intense for four months, but I could not have done it without the team at ASU and for the reasons that the special chancellor and the staff. Of course, my fellow CFOs back here, they all back to me remember things and can cover me when I'm in this place. So um, some of the folks, there was a huge team at ASU that helped us, but some of the folks I would like to specifically recognize for this, there are four folks um, three from Shannon Medical Services that they they um, dived in and helped us get the students back on our campus. And our students are arriving back on Sunday, so I'm very thankful for their help in all this. Dana Pittman, who is the Chief Nursing Officer, Chief Operations Officer at Shannon Clinic, she also is a three-time ASU graduate, so you know we're, she's one of our own anyway. But um, beginning from the beginning of the partnership with Shannon in 2015, Anna has been a key player in the delivery of student health services, having operational oversight and leading through numerous service recruitment and expanded health education programming for the benefit of ASU students. She has been ASU's medical emergency response partner since the onset of the 2015 agreement. We just hadn't had it activated until this summer, and she certainly stepped up to the role. Ms. Peggy Creel, RN, she's the Infection Prevention and Epidemiology Coordinator at Shannon Medical Center. She's not only an ASU graduate, but she's a very respected professional resource at ASU and amongst the Stansville community. Um, Dr. Andrew King, PO, Family Medicine at Shannon Clinic. He's the head of our Shannon Concussion Clinic since 2018 when we launched the on-campus Shannon Sports Medicine Clinic and the ASU Student Clinic. He's the medical director for ASU Student Health Services and has served in that role since 2017. His practice is located in our on-campus Shannon Clinic, so he's tied to the daily needs of ASU, and he has been a, a very strong leader in our discussions over how to have safe practices on our campus. And I would be remiss if I did not also include Dr. James Redis, um, you know, who is the emergency, he's been an emergency medicine physician for 41 years, but he also serves as City Angeles local health authority. So thank you to all of these folks for the help that they've given us at ASU. And then I have one recognition um, and one introduction that I would like to make. Um, not only do the people in the community support me, but my own team, the, the finance and administration, they all stepped up, but two gentlemen in particular have really stepped up to help me as I've made through these last four months. Um, Doug Fox, who's here with us today, sitting in our CFO spot back right there, he's a 1985 ASU graduate with a degree in computer science. He currently serves as our CIO. After graduating from ASU, um, Doug worked two years as a systems engineer for Singer Fleet Flight Simulation Division, developing flight simulation software systems for the U.S. Air Force F-16 Weapons System Trainer. I don't know about y'all, but I think that sounds pretty cool. Um, Mr. Fox has also worked for GTE, GTE Data Services in San Angelo, JJT Inc. as a software consultant. Cytel Corp. as Director of Management Information Systems in the ASU as an analyst before being hired as our Director of Technology in 1996. He's won numerous awards for his outstanding leadership and excellence in information technology, including being recognized by the American Association of University Administrators for demonstrating creative solutions to common issues in higher education. He's also served as chair of the Texas um, Connections Consortium, past chair of the Concha Valley School Board Council, Business Executive Leadership Council that oversees statewide shared technology services that are offered through the Texas Department of Information Resources. Um, and I uh, know he was also part of the transition team when ASU joined the TTU system. So thank you to Doug Fox for all he's done to support me and, and to get these four months and our students back. I'd like to recognize Mr. Brian Braden. Um, he currently serves as our Chief Technology Officer, but he is still in the backfield. Uh, so I kind of felt like Doug and Brian shared three jobs between the two of them for the past four months. Brian Braden has a Master of Science in Computer Science from a and and we won't hold that against him because he truly is a member of the Ray family now that he's with us here. He is a San Angelo native. Prior to coming to work at ASU in 2000, he worked at International Paper in Memphis, Tennessee in their IT division supporting their networks and computer systems, and as the Telecommunications Manager for Education Service Center Region 15 in San Angelo. He has served on various university, local, and statewide committees and organizations over the year. 
He's a, currently a member and a chair of the Texas Connection Consortium Leadership Council, which has a primary purpose of fostering collaboration among four institutions while providing leadership in the strategic planning and decision making for the statewide consortium. Brian is also serving on the Customer Advisory Council of the Higher Education Representative for the Department of Information and Resources. So I'd really like to thank these two guys for all they did to support me. Thanks a lot. Angie, on behalf of the board, we owe you a real thank you. Uh, you stepped in, I believe you've done your job with excellence and, and done the job of the president with excellence, and we would truly appreciate you playing that role and doing it swiftly and soon. Thank, thank you very much. Really appreciate that. President Stuben? I know He has a bit of as a, as a mask off there, so. uh, when I pull that mask off, it takes my hearing aids out. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I have um, four introductions this morning. First, I'd like to introduce Ernstine Dukes. Um, Dean Dukes was recently named uh, Dean of the University of Libraries on August 1st as a result of a national search. She served in several uh, administrative roles University Libraries, uh, uh, having been associate dean for 11 years, on two occasions, uh, she served as the interim dean, and it was her stable leadership and administrative success that provided a very strong endorsement for her selection as the dean. And she received her Bachelor of Arts at Northwestern State University of Louisiana and her Master's of Library Science from Clark Atlanta University. She's also done additional work in public administrations. She began her career at the University of Memphis and then spent time at the University of Texas at Dallas. After that, she was head of automation at the Fort Worth Public Library for two years and also worked at the College Center for Library Automation in Tallahassee, Florida. Um, Dean Duth has led a number of initiatives that expands the scope and benefit of the library, both in terms of technology and personal services. Uh, she, in conjunction with the graduate school, was primarily responsible for the transition to electronic thesis and dissertation. She's a member of the Association of College Research Libraries and serves in a number of professional positions in terms of that partnership. Um, we're very pleased to have Ernstine Duke serving as the Dean of University Libraries. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Tim Dodd. Uh, Tim was named the Dean of the College of Human Sciences on August 1st, also as a result of a national search. He is the James C. and Katie Young Regents Professor of Hospital Hospitality Management and Director of the Texas Wine Marketing Research Institute at Texas Tech. He's a native of New Zealand that becomes immediately obvious when you hear him speak. Um, and he received his master's degree in business and a doctorate in consumer economics from Texas Tech University. His research is involved in consumer behavior, wine education, and marketing research. And he's been involved in the Texas wine industry uh, since 1990, serving in various roles with the Texas Wine and Grape Growers Association, including as its president. He has been the interim dean in the College of Human Sciences for the past two years um, because of the health issues with, uh, related to the previous dean. And uh, for having served in that role, it was very evident during the search that he not only has the respect of the faculty, but also their affection. And Dr. Dodd, we're very pleased that you'll be serving as a dean of the College of Human Sciences. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Steve Presley. Dr. Presley is the director of the Institute of Environmental and Human Health and the Biological Threat Research Laboratory, which has been conducting coronavirus testing in the state of Texas. And thanks to their rapid response, Dr. Presley and his team, they were the state's first laboratory to begin testing for the coronavirus in February. And since then, they have conducted more than 9,500 tests 
across the 67 county region. Uh, him, he and his team um, have done an enormous job, and of course with support from colleagues at Texas Tech Health Sciences Center, but they, um, day after day, we receive a report on the, hun the hundreds of tests they conduct, and their resilience and their effort has been amazing. In fact, in recognition of their good work, they are designated as a CDC Sentinel Laboratory, and recently, the Texas Department of State Health Services awarded Dr. Presley and his team a $2.23 million grant to continue coronavirus-related activities through April 2022. Congratulations, Dr. Presley, and thank you. And finally, I would like to recognize Meredith Times. Meredith has recently been appointed as the Interim Texas Tech University COVID-19 Coordinator, and she also serves as the Assistant Director of the United Supermarkets Arena. She received her master's degree in communication studies at Texas Tech and has been an adjunct instructor in the College of Media and Communications since 2010. As the COVID-19 coordinator, Ms. Zimes is working to ensure all the Texas Tech employees and students and staff are aware of all of the initiatives and services that are provided to them. And, and a recent example of her good work was that um, the the coordination of free testing by the Texas Department of Emergency Management. Um, Meredith, in conjunction with Dr. Joe Hepford and colleagues at HSC, arranged for those free tests. And it's been going very, very well. We're very pleased to have you in this important role, Meredith. <laughs> Thank you. Those are the introductions, Mr. Chairman. President Light. I have no introductions at this time, sir. Good morning. I am pleased to announce the appointment of Dr. Dondra Sechrist as Dean of the School of Health Professions at the Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center, effective May 1st. I want to thank the search committee chaired by Dr. Branch Schneider, Dean of the Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences, for their outstanding work. Additionally, I appreciate those who participated in the interview process the candidates, town hall presentations, and for providing feedback of the finalists for this position. I selected Dr. Seekers based on the unanimous recommendation of the search committee, and we are fortunate to have someone of her caliber fill this vital role. With an academic and professional career that spans 25 years, Dr. Seekers brings an adept skill set regarding the fundamentals of higher education, as well as the values of interprofessional experiences across the healthcare discipline. In her previous role as the school's Associate Dean for Outcomes and Assessment and Associate Professor, she was viewed as a leader by her peers and recognized for her strong alignment with our values-based culture and her contributions to collaborative work among our schools and institutes. For the last four years, she has exemplified the university's visionary value in leading efforts to develop the school's strategic plan and aligning its mission and goals with the university. Dr. Seeker's passion for TTUHSC is evident and will no doubt be reflected in her position as Dean. Her demonstrated successes at the HSC will help to advance the school's momentum as our university continues to move forward. I'm truly grateful to Dr. Stephen Sawyer for his service as interim dean, especially with the recent challenges of the coronavirus pandemic. His commitment and dedication to sustain the school's trajectory to excellence provides a solid foundation for Dr. Seacrest to now take the School of Health Professions to the next school, to the next level. The School of Health Professions is the largest school on the HSC and is an integral part of our university's mission, mission to enrich the lives of others through health education, research, and patient care. I am confident that Dr. Seacrest will excel in leading the school to fulfill its purpose. Dr. Seacrest is a Lubbock High. She graduated from Monterey High School. She was an athlete there. She and her husband, Calvin, are deeply committed and involved in several boards in our community. We know that Dondra has the leadership skills to take us forward um, for our university. So join me in welcoming Dr. Seacrest. And that's all I have. Thank you all for those recognitions and introductions. I will say, those of you that took the time to come, 
thank you for doing that. Well, our meeting is going to be thrilling and exciting. Certainly, this might be a great opportunity for you to slip out the door. So uh, please feel free to do that if you have other places to be. Uh, the meeting of the Board of Regents of the Texas Tech University System is now called to order. The board will continue in open session and meet as a committee of the whole with a meeting of the board. Please note that this is a hybrid meeting uh, of the Board of Regents. We, in person, we have uh, Regents Mark Griffin, Michael Lewis, Mickey Long, John Steinmetz, or Walter Scheid, and myself, Christopher Huckabee. Uh, we have four regents that will be joining us uh, today online. That would be Dusty Womble uh, and also Ron Hammonds. Uh, John Walker, I don't know that John Walker has made it yet. John Walker's been delayed uh, in, in uh, Ginger Carrot. So we'll, we're, we're trying to do this in a bit of a hybrid fashion today. Uh, so, so give us a little grace as we work through the technology. Uh, I would like to thank, we've had a tremendous amount of administrators, staff that have worked very hard to put this meeting together, and I simply want to say thank you for doing that. Uh, it, it takes a lot to make this happen, to do the social distance the way we needed to do it, to make the technology work, and to everybody that's done that, thank you very much for your efforts. Uh, it is noted and appreciated for doing that. So, uh, To my fellow regents, the idea that I have Ron Hammond's in a giant screen staring over my shoulder is quite uncomfortable. Um, but I would ask that my fellow regents who are online keep in mind that you need to mute uh, and please unmute when you need to speak, just a housekeeping item in general. So thank you all uh, for playing along with us today. We will now approve the minutes of the previous board meetings. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the board meeting held on May 14th, 2020? In July 24th, 2020. Motion. I have a motion and I have a second. Any comments, questions? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 I vote, all those opposed, same sign. The motion carries. Thank you. We'll next hear from, from Mr. McQuinney regarding the schedule of board meetings for the remainder of 2020 and for 2021. You know, uh, Mr. Chairman, the board schedule remains the same as previously listed. Our next scheduled board meeting is on October 16th as a one-day board meeting. Next, we'll hear from our Student Government Association presidents. Each SGA president has sent us a pre-recorded report that will be presented at this time. We'll begin with the ASU Student Government Report presented by their president. Ms. Kristen Kilpatrick, please begin the video presentation for this. Good grammar and spelling are important. 
At FIT, we are planning on hosting various forums and town halls this semester. We are planning an SGA virtual town hall to take place in September. Um, we will also be speaking at a town hall led by the Division of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion to have conversations with our diverse student organizations about racial equity on our campus. And then finally, we are working on strengthening our budget and finance process by restructuring criteria for allocations. Historically, most data used in SGA funding is quantitative, um, but we will be including more qualitative data that better empowers our historically underrepresented student organizations. Again, I would just like to emphasize how grateful I am for the opportunity to present before you all today. More importantly, however, and on behalf of the whole student body, I would just like to say thank you for the ways that you are serving Texas Tech University. Uh, our current situation has forced some difficult decisions to be made, and that students continue to be kept at the center of the conversation. If you have any questions about my presentation today, or any questions about Texas Tech Main Campus, Our next presentation will be from the Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center, and their SGA president is Mr. Marcus Gonzalez. Please begin the Texas Tech Health Sciences Center video presentation. My name is Marcus Gonzalez, and I'm the TCU HSC Student Government Association president. Um, I'd like to thank the Board of Regents for allowing me to be here today and giving me the opportunity to share a little bit about what the SGA has accomplished in the past year, uh, interview starting off to King, and then kind of share a little bit about what we hope to accomplish in the year to come. Uh, without further ado, let's get started. So in the 2019-2020 session, we were able to pass 20 legislative pieces, a big chunk of those being congratulatory. Um, I think this just speaks to uh, the quality of the educators that are in the HSC. Anytime we get to recognize them for their hard work and dedication, we'd love to do so. Um, other illustrated pieces focus on academic and health resources available to students, um, and the program of assistance for students, which we advocated uh, for an increase of funding for, and we were able to secure um, more sessions for our students. Uh, so we're really appreciative to administration for working with us on getting that done. Um, we were also able to award over $75,000 in scholarships via our Clonathon and Double T scholarship. Uh, Service-wise, we were able to fundraise over $1,500, and these funds were invested right back into our student body for the scholarships. And then also, we were able to volunteer for 400 hours to our community at the center. Uh, financially, we were able to allocate $86,000 um, to support about 70 student organizations at the HSC. And of course, none of this would have been possible without great leadership, so we want to thank our 2019-2020 executive officer team for all their hard work and dedication uh, to the SGA and to the student body over the past year. And now to introduce our new officer team and what we hope to accomplish in the year ahead. So first we have our BPD of Finance, Tim Brown. Tim is an MD-PhD student in the class of 2022, but he actually just completed his PhD uh, portion of his degree, uh, so he is now Dr. Tim Brown. Uh, 
uh, history of astral North Carolina, he enjoys to ski, hike, exercise, and play the banjo in his spare time. And his goals for the year kind of center around making sure that our student boards um, take as, as uh, small of an impact from the COVID-19 pandemic and any sort of financial ramifications as possible. Um, so Tim's ready to tackle the books and uh, make sure that our student boards are fully funded for the year. VP uh, of Operations is Daniel K. Guerra. Uh, Daniel is a classmate of mine in the MD class of 2023. Uh, he's from Plano, Texas, and when he's not studying medicine, he likes to look at his creative side, and especially his digitally creative side. Um, his goals for the year involve uh, centralizing our resource bank for students just to make sure that uh, those resources are as easily accessible as possible, and then theoretically, this should uh, improve um, student utilization uh, rates for these resources. Um, we also are looking into revising protocols for keeping our senators accountable just because things look differently now in the era of Zoom, so we aren't going to be meeting in person as much. Next, we have our VP of Communication, Rachel Thornton. Uh, Rachel's a really good friend and classmate of mine and an MBA in the class of 2023. Uh, she's from Phoenix, Arizona, and in her spare time, uh, she likes to spend time with her dog Finn, and they love to hike in the trails or swim. And her goals for the year kind of center around um, improving communication within the SGA just to make sure that the ball doesn't get dropped or anything and uh, to ensure that student concerns are making their way to the Senate um, as quickly as, as efficiently as possible. Um, again, I'm Marcus Gonzalez and I'm the president of the SGA for this year. Um, I'm also an MD and BA with degree student in the class of 2023. Um, both Rachel and I are actually going to earn our um, MBAs in August 2020, so we're really excited about that. Um, another little tidbit, I'm actually a graduate uh, from undergrad also, so I did my undergrad at Texas Tech University. Um, I'll soon earn my MBA from the Rawls College of Business and then eventually, hopefully, uh, earn my, my medical degree from an HSC. So I'm really proud of the fact uh, that I'll be a graduate through and through uh, by the time I'm done. Uh, some hobbies of mine include uh, spending time with my family and friends and reading when I can when I'm not studying medicine. And some of my goals for the year uh, involve implementing town hall meetings or online forum just to make sure that we're getting uh, feedback from the student body and making sure that we open any sort of avenue for communication with the student body. And hopefully, uh, and this season to my next point, uh, we improve that relationship between the SGA and the student body and, and help with uh, the already tight community that we have at the HSC. I also hope to continue to advocate for student health and mental well-being, especially um, in light of recent events over the past few months. The COVID-19 pandemic has hit a lot of people really hard, so I want to make sure that students still feel cared for, uh, even if they're not on campus, and that they still have access to the same resources um, that they would have had if they were still on the local campus. Um, I also want to continue to support efforts to celebrate the first diversity. Um, I think it's no secret that official tensions are been high in the moment, but I want to make sure that um, HSC students understand that regardless of our differences, that we can all appreciate in terms of race ethnicity, gender, um, background, uh, even our chosen health profession, that at the end of the day, we're all red graders, uh, and we're at the HSC for the common goal of serving our future patients and our future communities as the future researchers and um, caregivers of tomorrow. So as long as we keep that goal and goal in mind, um, you know, we should be able to treat each other with respect and dignity and equality. And I know the administration supports us and they make every effort every day, day in and out, um, so I hope the SGA and myself can continue to support those efforts in the year ahead. Um, that concludes my presentation. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be here with you today. Hope to meet some of you in person, <laughs> hopefully at some point, and I'm looking forward to working alongside you this upcoming year. If there's anything that the SGA or myself can do to help push CTU system wide initiatives, please feel free to reach out. Um, but again, thank you for your time. This concludes my presentation, and I'll be right back. Our last SGA report of the day is from the Health Sciences Center in El Paso and their SGA president, Ms. Jessica Tom. Uh, please begin the Health Sciences Center El Paso SGA report. Hello, Texas Tech Region. My name is Jessica Tom, and I am the new Student Government Association President for the Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center in El Paso. Nice to meet you all virtually. Today, I will be providing the August 2020 report for our campus. I understand the report has not been given on our behalf for some time, so 
So I will be recapping some events from earlier in the year as well. In January, SGA helped to host the Martin Luther King Jr. Day of Service. This day of service was focused on implementing public health initiatives in five communities in El Paso, Southern Park, Montana Vista, San Elizario, Downtown, and Northeast. Initiatives ranged from health fairs, to community kitchen cooking demonstrations, to student book giveaways. Additionally, a mental health task force at each site educated community members on stress management strategies with a focus on community resilience in the wake of the August 3rd El Paso shooting. This event engaged over 140 student volunteers and reached almost 400 community members. In February, the Paula Foster School of Medicine celebrated its 10 year anniversary at the Red Tie Affair for a white coat occasion. For nine months leading up to this event, PTU HSC El Paso was able to raise over $775,000 for student scholarships. Scholarship recipients, some of whom are shown here, mingled with donors and guests at the event. In March, the Paula Foster School of Medicine hosted a virtual match day to celebrate the accomplishments of our fourth year medical students. Students found out via email where they matched their residency. 53% of our MS scores matched in Texas, 57% matched in a primary care specialty, and 16 will be training in El Paso. Our fourth years also matched into various specialties across the nation as shown here. We are so proud of them and wish them all the best in their future careers. In April, we were planning to have our SGA Spring Day of Service called Embeciendo El Paso, which means beautifying El Paso. We have partnered with Rebuilding Together which is an organization that rebuilds homes of families, seniors, people with disabilities, and victims of disasters, while raising awareness of housing problems facing 1.65 million Americans. We have identified three El Paso homes to re-beautify, but unfortunately we had to cancel this event due to COVID-19. In May, due to COVID-19, we were also unable to host our annual SGA awards ceremony where we usually honor students and faculty for their service and excellence. We chose to still host online nominations and voting to award faculty and students from each class in each of the three schools on campus. The results were released via an email announcement. Additionally, we awarded five student excellence scholarships. These outstanding students were nominated by the deans of each school for this $2,000 scholarship. In May, we also hosted a virtual graduation for all three schools on our campus. We had over 200 graduates, 86 from the medical school, 84 from the nursing school, and 33 from the graduate school. Congratulations to all of our 2020 graduates. In June, SGA hosted a campus vigil in remembrance of Black lives lost to racism and social injustice. At this one month anniversary of George Floyd's death, we had speakers, musical guests, and a candlelight vigil. The school was lit in red and gold for 8.46 days to symbolize George Floyd's high school colors and his struggle for life, respectively. We also provided anti-racism resources to continue to stimulate conversation and change in our community. In July, we elected a new SGA Executive Council and added a new position, the VP of Student Development. This position is dedicated to creating programming for leadership skills and development, and is also focused on matters relating to diversity and inclusion. In August, SGA hosted a Luminaria distribution for the one year anniversary of the August 3rd El Paso shooting. We handed out 300 luminarias, as well as resources for victims and their families. El Pasoans across the city lit up luminarias on their front porch in remembrance of the 23 lives lost that day. In the next few months, we hope to host a welcome event for all of our students, new and returning. 
as well as our fall day of service, known as Corazon de Oro, or Heart of Gold. We are still figuring out the logistics for how to do this safely and in a socially distant manner, but we're hoping to continue these traditions as best as we can. Thank you so much for your time today, and please feel free to reach out to me via email if I can ever be of service. Have a wonderful rest of your day. So thanks to all our SJ presidents for the reports. Meeting of the Board of Regents will now recess in order to conduct the trustees meeting of the Clark Scholarship Foundation. Meeting of the Board of Regents will reconvene immediately upon adjournment of the trustees meeting of the Clark Scholarship Foundation. Regent Griffin serves as the chair of the Clark Scholarship Foundation. Regent Griffin, please proceed with that meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The meeting of the Board of Trustees of the Car, Found Car Scholarship Foundation is now called to order. The first order of business is approval of the minutes. Is there a motion to approve the min minutes of the F Car Foundation meeting held on August 8, 2019? I think you have that ex under separate cover, and uh, I would await a motion for approval. So moved. Second. Second. There's been a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. The, the minutes are approved. Next order of business is acceptance of the independent auditor's report of the Scholar Car Scholarship Foundation for the year ending August 31, 2019. Mrs. Turner, welcome. Will you please present the item regarding the independent auditor's report for the Car Scholarship Foundation? Yes, thank you. The CPA firm of Bolinger Seegers, Gilbert, and Moss performed the fiscal 2019 audit of the Car Foundation. The first item of note is that they did issue an unmodified opinion, that's a clean opinion, on the financial statements for 2019. There's some highlights from the financials. Fiscal 19 was a difficult year for the Car Foundation. The net position um, decreased by 8.7 million between 2018 and 2019, primarily with the result of Decline in asset value in the long term fund and decreases in both investment value and the annual and gas royalties. Net position as of August 31, 2019 is 144.8 million. In 2019, the car earned oil and gas royalties of 4.9 million and experienced a net investment loss of 3.5 million, which is a $21 million negative swing from 2018 investment earnings. The valuation of oil and gas and other mineral properties held by the car also decreased during 2019 to uh, approximately 17.2 7 million at the end of 2018 to 14.7 million at the end of 2019. Mineral properties, you may recall, are valued at three times the prior year of production. Distributions to the car scholarship fund um, still remain pretty steady. They were 9.5, sorry, 9.1 million, which was slightly higher than the previous year. You might recall that we did have to switch accounting standards for the basis of the Car Foundation financial statements from FASB to GASB, governmental accounting standards. And there's a, GASB 75 requires um, including deferred inflows and outflows related to teacher retirement system and employee retirement system liabilities in the Car Foundation financial statements. Um, so you see those adjustments in these statements. In reviewing the journal entries that were required to properly state the financial statements at year end, all of those were normal year end adjustments that you would expect to see. There was there were no um, errors or anything like that that had to be corrected. The largest adjustments were the mark to market adjustments to state mineral interest at fair market value and the entries related to pension and OFS. The auditors also issue a board communications letter. It's required by audit standards. This letter confirmed that they did not encounter any issues in performing the audit. They had no disagreements with management about accounting treatments or other aspects of the audit. And then last, the auditors did not issue a management letter. Management letters are used to communicate internal control weaknesses that they see, and they did not issue such a letter this year. That concludes the report. Thank you, Mrs. Turner. Chairman Griffin, I do want to point out that um, it is typical uh, of accounting firms to have an accounting Thank you. We can discuss that with the auditors for the upcoming year. 
Thank you, Mr. Turner. Thanks, John. Are there any other questions or comments? Hearing none, then, is there a motion to accept the independent auditor's report for the Carr Scholarship Foundation as presented? Thank you, John. Second. There's a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Any Aye. opposed? Thank you. The report uh, is accepted. Thank you very much. Mrs. Wright, will you please provide a brief overview of the Carr Scholarship Foundation plan, please? Thank you, sir. Thank you. So, in light of the fact that uh, so many of our high schools cannot do testing right now, they can't do their ACT or SATs, for those that are under um, three of the the that we've given you, there's a couple of different things. One is that Before you do, may I ask a question, please, regarding this uh, the scholarship award amounts? Yes. Is that at variance that uh, under, if we were operating under normal conditions with the additional uh, aspect of the SAT or ACT scores, would that have changed, or will that change for historically the the award amounts that are being given out? But on the amounts themselves, based upon those particular classifications, so Angie, is there a variance there? There is a little bit of a variance. We used to have a large fifteen thousand dollars scholarship, and we've changed that. And you'll notice these three categories at the end: the six thousand, eight thousand, and twelve thousand. We've broken out the group that would have been awarded fifteen thousand, and we're going to award more in those categories, but not quite as much as the fifteen thousand that we had been awarded. So, so what I guess what I'm hearing on those last three tiers, the higher GPA numbers, while those had been typically fifteen thousand dollar, but there were fewer. You're adding, you're you're creating a greater uh, pool, if you will, and and combining it with yes. with varying dollars. There, the end of, end result is we could act in actuality be giving more per student in those particular. Aspects. Yes, thank you. Any other questions? Are there any other questions or comments? Thank you, Ms. Wright. Now, would you uh, present for approval the 2021 Car Scholarship Foundation budget, please? Yes, sir. So here is our proposed fiscal year. Fiscal year 2021 budget. Um, the focus is basically flat to the budgets that we have in the past. We're not increasing either how much we're spending within the Car Foundation or the total amount of awards um, that are budgeted to go out based on the fact that oil and gas prices and, of course, the LTEC has gone up and down as rates go up and down. Um, 
We're always trying to be conservative with this budget because we are basing it on something that is very fluid and always has been, regardless of COVID. This has always been a fluid thing. I did want to um, be sure and remind all of the regions or explain to the regions who are new that the income that we use to award scholarships is based on a 12 quarter rolling average. So while oil and gas royalties have certainly dropped, um, we typically would see around $400,000 a month in monthly income from the oil and gas royalty. In April, we hit 241, and in May and June, we were down to 86,107. So the income coming into the endowment has reduced. But the LTIP quarterly distribution, since they're based on the rolling average, um, that has not gone down as drastically as our new income has. So um, for the quarter two of FY20, we received $2.3 million, and for quarter three of FY20, we um, still received $2.3 million. It was a decrease of 17000 So although there is a huge concern about oil and gas income coming into the actual foundation, it has not significantly impacted our ability to continue this the uh, $9 million in awards that we typically give out. Good. And can I add that um, a, a lot of companies shut in their production, and while we pay uh, no operating expenses, uh, if, if the well is shut in because it's uneconomic for the working interest, that's probably one of the things that has such a dramatic impact. And those wells are starting to come back on. Thank you, John. Any other comments or questions? Hearing none then, is there a motion to approve the 2021 Carr Scholarship Foundation budget as presented? So moved. Thank you, Mickey. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Thank you. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Thank you. The, the budget is approved. Uh, before we get to any other announcements, Ms. Wright, if I might, just a couple of questions. Is it appropriate or does the foundation engage someone like a Netherlands Sewell or someone to do a reserve analysis on the existing uh, oil and gas properties that, that are under that foundation? Are, are you familiar with that type of report and would it, is it instructive if you are? I'm not as familiar with that type of Sure. Uh, but I can certainly take that question back to her and ask. Thank, if you would, I would just be interested, and I don't know if, if Regent Walker has a comment regarding that, John, or not. Would that be instructive in, under these circumstance, in your opinion? I don't think right now, and I, I don't think uh, hiring uh, an outside major donor would be appropriate in the sense you know, we have some cost constraints. Uh, these these uh, wells, for the most part, have, have been there for a very long time. And I, I think it would be okay, you know, every five years or something of that sort, to, if, if we're going to have an independent report. But there are much smaller shops that could do that same thing. Okay. And I do believe we've had some independent outside um, audits of these. We've done that. I, I think we've we've done that review. Eight years ago. Maybe yeah, it, it was a while ago that okay. review was done. Thank you. Since Mark, you've been here, Gary, probably. Yeah. Okay. Mark, that was a question that was brought up. And I think the analysis was done on what the re, uh, reserve uh, report would be the cost of it. Was like eight hundred thousand. Yeah, it, 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 it was close to a million. Cost pro, it was cost prohibitive, yeah. probably. Cost prohibitive, and there really wasn't much value gained by it. I don't think you would have been saying that. Okay. But still, if there are smaller independent firms that could do it, but it, it would still be 50 to 100 bucks. Okay, thank you. One, just one more, Ms. Wright, if I might, and I want to commend you with the ebbs and flows of the of the oil and gas revenues and uh, the volatility in our investment income, I, I want to commend you for staying hitched and firm on these scholarship awards. 
this has nothing to do with the students that we are awarding. They have nothing to do with this. It's out of their control, but by the same token, I think we need to be st stay true to the charter and the charge of what the Carr Scholarship Foundation is about, and I commend you for, for staying committed to, to awarding those uh, scholarship dollars even in tough economic times because I think it sends a very strong message of commitment to the student, and I thank you for that. Is there any other, that's the final item of business, is there any other announcements to come before this, uh, this board? If not, if there's no further business, then do I hear a motion to adjourn this meeting? Thank you. The Board of Trustees of the Carr Foundation stands adjourned. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Regents. Meeting of the Board of Regents of the Texas Tech University System is now called to order. Board will continue in open session to meet as a committee of the whole, committee and board. Deputy Chancellor Burris, President Wright, Lane, Rice Spearman, Scubinet, please present your reports on COVID 19. Good morning. Thank you, Chairman and all the regents for having us today. So myself and the President and the Chancellor are going to kind of walk through what we have done um, to prepare for the fall and the next the COVID-19. First, before we dive into the details, I want to recognize the communications and marketing teams at each university. They have done an outstanding job. We heard your feedback at the last regent meeting that we need to do a better job communicating, and I think everyone took that and took it to another level. Are we perfect? Is there still more we could do? Is there still more people we probably need to reach? Um, for sure, but overall, I think everyone's done a great job. We have put together a little highlight reel video for you all to see of uh, the efforts that have been done.
The great prayer and I can't wait to welcome you to our magnificent campus this fall. Recognize. This is a time that we are all going to choose to be sacrificial and not selfish. We're going to do that as a university system. We're going to do that as individuals. And we're going to do that to take care of one another. So, all of those videos were longer videos, but that is a clip and the idea of what our messaging is as we move forward and bring students back to the fall. Okay, for the sake of the presentation, we're going to cover some of more of the pressing topics that we've been working on. Um, in your documents uh, you received from the meeting, you received a 415 page document of all the memos, procedures, precautions, everything that has been done across the universities. I know you've all read it from start to <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Particulars. <laughs> That's the right answer. Um, so we're going to go through a few of these today. Oh, back. Um, so these are the things we're going to touch on today. At the end of the presentation, you'll hear, hear more from each president and um, some of the efforts they are doing to get ready. So this is more on the system level. First, I want to talk a little bit about um, our communication structure. So when this started, we implemented a 9 a.m. touch base meeting on Mondays. It's just the presidents. Um, Tuesday and Thursday, we have up to 30 people on that. We focus on the healthcare part of COVID-19. On Wednesday and Friday, we focus on the academic. We've had up to over 50 people on these calls. Um, all the presidents join in for all of these. We have a touch base daily call most all days with Chairman Huckabee at the end of the day. And then through this process, there was um, a need uh, identified to put together more of a system working group. There was a cross-section of all the areas that we need expertise in to really dig in the weeds of how we're going to do this and try to do this safely. And so these individuals are the ones that serve on that system working group um, to um, get in the weeds. We do this once a week, and I feel like it's probably been pretty beneficial uh, in doing that, and you'll see their work throughout the presentation. So first, we're going to talk about face mask, and for Regent Hammond's sake, when he needs another job, I guess he can join our communications and marketing team um, on his idea to be a mask writer. When we talk about face mask, um, in all of our conversations, it was, we don't want to look back we know that we're gonna have some issues and we don't wanna look back and think we could have done more. So we wanna do everything we can to be safe. And this is one of the first policies that we did at the system level um, was the face mask issue. So face masks are required. We wanna take this as an educational approach. We don't wanna to have to take any disciplinary action, but we have put in processes and procedures for faculty and staff to use if needed. Um, Dr. Skubinek, I don't know if you want to add in any of um, anything on the face mask topic. Thank you, Kendra. We uh, issued uh, a memo in late June mandating the use of face masks. Um, it was a fairly extensive policy that allowed for conditions that might relate to health or uh, religious considerations. But that policy has been integrated into every aspect of the university operations, in the classrooms, in the dorms, in other public spaces. Um, there's been a lot of communication to those different units as to how to uh, make sure that policy is being adhered to, what to do when problems arise. And for instance, uh, the instructions to teachers specify that on the first day of class, you'll spend some time discussing the policies as it relates to face masks. And there's very detailed information given to them as to what you might do when problems arise. Ultimately, those issues would be referred to student affairs, but our attitude is not to go out and try to uh, create confrontational situations with weather appeal, 
to uh, one's responsibility to one another in a sense of peer pressure. Thank you, Dr. Stephen. So next, campus event policy. Um, you know, a lot of this is mandated at the governor's level um, through the state. We, um, part of this, we have really tried to align not only with the state, but our um, city and local officials. I have a weekly Monday morning call with our mayor, Dr. Lane, Angie, Dr. Topliff have weekly calls with their city officials also, so that we can try to stay in line with what our communities are doing, and if we're not in line, then we can at least communicate and know where we're coming from on that. A few things that we've done to um, go above and beyond what the local mandates are, no food or drinks um, at those events, um, attendance, taking attendance is required, so at the point we need contact tracing, then we have um, that. Health screenings. So this was a topic that we um, talked a lot about in the working group. Um, the power of shared information is something that we've really um, garnered from this working group. We want to do have as many proactive steps as possible, and health screenings is one of those areas that we identified that would be proactive in bringing students back. Um, ASU really led this effort. All IT um, offices are now working together and taking a platform much like ASU and adapting it to fit their needs. But Angie, you want to talk a little bit about um, your health screening app that you put together? Yes, thank you, Kendra. So early on, we realized that we would have um, some concerns about a one-time test. I know the universities have done that, but we at our university had some concerns not only about the cost of sending out a test, but we wanted to be sure that our students were staying, staying safe and healthy throughout the entire semester. And as I mentioned before, I've got two IT guys backing me on the operational side as I've stepped up to this role. So our IT team put together this health screening app, or I'm supposed to call it a tool, I keep saying app, but I'm supposed to call it a tool. And basically you go onto this tool and you can get to it either on your phone, your iPad, whatever media you prefer to use, you can go on and you simply answer the questions, the same ones all of us have answered every time you've gone in any time about a hospital setting or a business where they have somebody personally screening you, have you had a fever, do you have any of the symptoms, have you been around anybody? You answer these questions and if you answer all the questions in a way that it shows that you are still safe and healthy and you do not suspect or have been around anyone with COVID, then it gets a badge like we show you over here on the right side of that. Our students can use those in the buildings where we are monitoring for you to come into a building or into a classroom. They can simply show their phones with that badge and then they don't have to stop and have their temperature taken and, and be screened in any further ma uh, manner. Um, another thing that we had done was we had a daily dashboard created and so um, I'm able to get this information real time every day of how many people have actually gone out and done this and on Tuesday, we had 515 employees and 345 students go out and go through the wellness tool. So we do feel like it's it's very successful in our implementation. Folks are using it and those numbers, so 515 employees, we don't have faculty on campus yet. So this is pretty much almost all of our staff and not all of our staff. And we don't have very many students on this campus yet because they just start moving in. Um, they moved, our international students came yesterday. Um, if you don't pass, the, if you answer any of those, if you have a fear, if you answer any of those, what happens is that the tool gives you a message that says you need to, to contact a health provider. If you live in San Angel or if you're one of our students, you can go to Shannon On Demand and online and um, go through a screening that they have and determine if you need to go be tested. And in addition to that, an email goes out to the appropriate person or persons um, that need to know that you could possibly have to be tested. And for example, uh, Dr. Topoff decided to test this the other day and be sure that it was working. He was beta testing for us. So I got an email at 7.30 in the morning that said he wasn't well. And I'm a little panicked because we're 10 days before school starts and my provost just sent me a message that said he wasn't well. And then he calls and says, I was just making sure that it worked. And it did. I got the email that said he wasn't well and I got a follow-up email from um, him saying that he was um, really okay. He was just taking out the answers on the test. So we're real proud of this tool. 
And um, Phil just said at the beginning of this, I'm going to stay really high level, but if anybody wants to sit down and have side conversations and go through the weeds of all of this, we're happy to do that too. So next, contact tracing. Contact tracing is one of the key elements that we think um, we need to be very successful at if we're going to be successful bringing students back. Um, it's not going to be easy, so we have spent a lot of time discussing this and how best to do this. Um, Dr. Ross Spearman, do you want to speak a little bit about the conversations around contact tracing and how the system will move forward with this? Contact tracing and case investigation are fundamental activities that involve working with those who have been diagnosed both symptomatic and asymptomatic with COVID-19 to identify and provide support to people who are contacts who may have been infected through exposure to the individual. This process prevents further transmission of disease by separating people who have or may not have the have had interaction with individuals. It is a core disease control measure that has been employed by public health agency personnel for decades. Case investigation and contact tracing are most effective when they are part of a multifaceted response to an outbreak. So we've taken a three-part approach to contact tracing. First, we've developed response teams across all of our universities, and we've ensured that those response teams have training uh, through uh, one example of training is a Johns Hopkins course to ensure that they are prepared and have the information that they need to be able to conduct the contact tracing. And then also we've developed data management systems within the contact tracing. A second is we've developed contact tracing resources for the communities in which we serve. Many of our city and county health departments have reached out to us and asked us for help. And so we have students and faculty and staff involved in also supporting those contact tracing efforts. And third, the Health Sciences Center in Lubbock and in, Paso, and in El Paso have joined into a contract with the Department of Health and Human Services uh, at a $4.7 million price tag for us to help support contact tracing across the state of Texas. So this is an example of how we're using contact tracing across the system. Thank you. And as you can see here, we have um, hired full-time employees. We've um, reallocated job duties so that we can be prepared and not be a burden on the city, but work very closely with them, our communities are. Um, Dr. Ross Spearman talked a little bit about the response teams. Um, we're trying to prepare for every situation. That's not gonna be possible. There's no way to know what truly Paul will bring for us. So for the situations that we have that our decision trees, our guidelines, our protocols don't meet, we have 24 hour a day services from the response team. Um, Dr. Skubanek introduced Meredith, Meredith Imes who has led the one at Tech, ASU's, you see the names for the Health Science Center and for El Paso. This is also where the contact tracing will be housed, Bridge University. So they put it together a lot of effort and are doing an amazing job. So we move on to decision trees. This is one of many decision trees that we have in your 414 page document. Um, this is when an employee tests positive and the protocol and how we will go through this. And Dr. Lane and Eric Bentley worked very closely and he took the lead on um, decision trees that we developed. So Dr. Lane, um, if you want to discuss this a little bit. Be yeah, happy to. Again, I want to thank uh, Eric for his assistance and really the, uh, the working group that met on Wednesday. Uh, the advantage of being a system is you have some great general academic institutions like Texas Tech University and ASU. You also have the health expertise as well, the Texas Tech Health Science Center here in Lubbock and the regional campuses and ours as well. So you saw that there were four physicians that participated uh, in the working group. Uh, Dave Edwards and Ron Cook are now in Lubbock uh, and Paul Ogden, my provost and myself as well. And what we're able to do is we're able to keep up with the Center for Disease Control, the CDC guidelines, that change oftentimes on a daily basis with recommendations about um, what are the symptoms that are suggestive of COVID, who needs to be screened, what testing needs to be done, when do the tests need to be done, who needs to be isolated, who needs to be quarantined, um, when can they return to work, who else needs to be notified, how do you disinfect things. And so keeping up with this on a regular basis, and by the way, it's different for every institution because our institutions are different. I don't have dorms, for example, or residences where the general academic institutions do. So using the CDC guidelines, the working group and the physicians in particular were able to develop 
general guidelines which could be customized to each institution. For example, what you when, when a worker or a student says, I have symptoms or I've been tested, what do you do? What do you tell them? What do you recommend? Who else needs to be notified? When they say, my roommate or my household contact has tested positive or symptoms, what do you tell them? How do you advise them? When the supervisor has an employee or the supervisor has a household contact, what do you do or what do you tell them? So using these guidelines, every institution was able to go through these and make very specific recommendations. So it didn't leave it up to chance. We didn't expect the supervisor to know what the CDC guidelines were or the student. But as a group, we developed those guidelines uh, if each institution implemented them. And I again, compliments to the entire working group. Uh, it was a, a phenomenal job. And by the way, these will be updated on a regular basis based upon what the recommendations are from the CDC. Thank you. So you have examples in your packet from all universities. We pulled um, text uh, examples. So they took the decision tree, made their supervisor gu guide, built out their employee guide. We also did a decision tree for student affairs um, when we have students that test positive and how we handle that, which led it to the academic units. Dr. Skubnik spoke earlier about how the language that we're putting in for the syllabus and we're requiring seating charts in our classrooms so that it can help with the contact tracing when we have a positive test with a student. So another conversation we spoke about quite a bit is how to be transparent so that we are transparent in our active cases and our recovered cases. So each university now will have a dashboard on their website. Any parents, students, the media, this is where we will direct all questions on what our current cases are for positive testing. You can see at HSC, they even have it broken down by their campuses um, across the West Texas. And there you have Tech and El Paso. So next, air filtrations. Um, the quality of air in our classrooms and across our campuses is a national topic. And um, so I'm going to ask Billy Relove to speak further about what our different universities have done to improve our air filtration systems. Thank you, Kendra. I'm trying not to touch anything up here, but through insight and summaries that were issued by the American Society of Heating, Refrigerating, and Air Conditioning Engineers, also known as ASHRAE, um, we have some, some insight to what we need to do for our indoor air quality. So we worked with all the university facility teams at El Paso, HSC, Texas Tech, and ASU to look at indoor air quality and what we can do. And I want to hats off to the facilities chairs there because they have done a tremendous job in this short time frame of getting some some um, things implemented into the, the air handling and air filtration system. So um, first thing they, they wanted to do was increase outside air intake, more fresh air bringing into the buildings. Um, this is more, we, you know, we call it air exchanges per hour, basically taking a volume of a box, how many times you can fill it up with fresh air and exhaust it out. So they've increased that so we have better and more fresh air coming in. And you can see the, the filter changes that we're also doing in just, just kind of rough numbers from the different institutions. Um, there's about 1,510 air handling units that have filters in. You can see the gentleman uh, in the picture there are changing out the filters. So in a short time frame, there was a lot of filters that needed to be changed. Where they, are, they were already changing filters, but we just made it more frequently because we're bringing in more fresh air as we, as we go. So we looked at enhanced preventive maintenance on the air handling equipment. Belts, shivs, motors, pulleys, um, the housing equipment to make sure everything is running as efficiently as it can. Some are utilizing portable freestanding air scrubbers or negative air machines. I know Athletics is using one in their equipment room. HSC has some of those. These are units that you just take and plug into the wall that have a pre-filter and maybe a HEPA or a MERV filter in there that is just continually scrubbing the air. And then we also looked at maintaining constant relative air uh, humidity. ASHRAE recommends 40 to 60%. Not all of our air handling units have humidity control systems in it, but maybe research. Um, you've probably got some in your medical facilities, theaters, those type groups do have that. So we're trying to be very proactive in getting the humidity into that, top, into that range. 
We also are looking at um, different types of treatment technologies, air treatment. Uh, FPNC hosted a forum back in May that had engineers, suppliers, manufacturers come in just to talk about the different types of technology. These are not new technologies. These have been around for decades. They're used in healthcare and research facilities, um, but they're a more permanent type solution that you actually insert and wire into your air handling units or supply ducts. Um, some of those are ultraviolet systems, ionization technology, photocatalytic oxidation. Um, we also look at electrostatic cleaners too. We're looking at these in existing buildings, buildings that, are, that we're constructing right now and also buildings that are in design. So if we can implement those or take advantage of the situation that we have, um, we're letting the, the different institutions make that decision. So there's many options out there. There's lots of layers in these HVAC systems. Um, I want to assure you that your facilities teams, all your institutions are doing a fantastic job and hats off to the men and the women out there doing the work because we're doing a great job and make our hands as safe as we can. Chancellor, are there any federal grants or available funds to assist us in the costs associated with these improvements? No, I I, I've not heard of any. Christina, we have talked to our uh, federal folks. I don't think there's specific, but they give, there's federal funds available to help you with costs related to the loss of funds from COVID-19, but that's really more operational costs. Uh, I've not seen or heard from our uh, federal folks anything available uh, for upgrades on equipment. Christina here. Mark, do you know anything in Austin with that? Here. No, I mean, they can use their institutional right. share that they got of the CARES Act, right. and Gary's team is submitting it for fee on reimbursement. So, okay. Reason Reason is specifically to your question, we did get federal funding for institutional sports specifically to address additional expenses related to the COVID disruption. So we do have that, and this is the example that we have used to support that. In addition to um, infrastructure with regards to our internet to provide additional access to students and additional license um, equipment that we've had to upgrade our infrastructure on IT, this is also available for that, so we did get that for a good part of that. Okay, um, now we're going to turn it over to the presidents. So far, any questions? I don't need to gloss over this or go over this quickly. Obviously, we get in the weeds, and I'm happy to um, have those conversations, but this is just a synopsis of how we've structured it and how we're handling things. Um, any questions or comments before we go um, to the presidents? Okay. Um, first, we're going to talk about El Paso, Dr. Lane. Great. Thank you, Kevin. I think you've already heard about what some of the campus-wide uh, initiatives are. So it's not just unique to education, but all our campuses, whether it's routine communication on fa protective face masks, social distancing, disinfecting services, um, uh, avoiding gatherings as well, and daily screening. So this is universal across our campus. Uh, early on, we, as Dr. Rice Turner mentioned, we established four task forces, one dealing with the clinical areas, one dealing with research, one dealing with administration, and one dealing with academic. And hats off to Dr. Paul Ockman, the of the academic task force. I'll tell a little bit about what we're doing to try to make it educationally safe. Um, obviously, we're converting as much of the didactic stuff online as possible. Now, we've already been doing asynchronous learning already where the students work, teach themselves at home and come in and do team-based learning. So it wasn't as big a stretch, but obviously many of the classes had to be converted to online. So we're doing both synchronous and asynchronous learning at the same time. For those areas where it did involve team-based learning, we do live streaming right now because of the infrastructure we have and the, the learning platforms that we have as well. Um, in fact, we've even converted our uh, on-campus anatomy course to a guided virtual anatomy course so students can learn their anatomy uh, in the comforts of their own home, even in their pajamas if they want to. There's some stuff that has to be learned on campus. You can be in the medical field and not see patients or touch patients or learn from them. So some of the things we've done, for example, is standardize patients. Um, this has given us not only a challenge, but an opportunity. Because we also have to instruct students now how do you conduct physical exams and interview patients in an area where everybody's got to wear PPE. 
So now our standardized patients and our medical students that are learning are both learning PPE, conducting uh, physical distancing, conducting both the history, and obviously getting together for the exam. For parts of the exam, ear, nose, and throat, where you don't want to do that, and that setting's done virtually as well, just to make it a safe, safe setting. As mentioned, uh, as Kendra mentioned, uh, we have the benefit of uh, having a, a campus where all of our students, when they attend, the limited time they do, there's a seating chart so we know exactly where they're at. So if contact tracing ends up being important, we're going to identify who the person was that was exposed in the areas around them as well, which is incredibly important. All of our study spaces have to be reserved now. As you can see uh, on the pictures here, I, again, on the top left daily screen, on the bottom left, a routine classroom and or spell study center. We can see where X's are marked off. The students, the places where students can see are marked, so there is social distancing in every room that students could be. There's card entry as well, which alert, alerts us to what students have been in what room, so again, if we need to do contact tracing. In the top right, shows just one of the many forms of the communication we have. There's signs posted all over campus about what the expectations are. As you're aware, we've had uh, communication among all our campuses on a daily basis, Monday through Friday. We've communicated this to the students. We hold round by virtual lunch, lunches with virtually every student in our school, every medical school class, the graduate students, and the nursing students as well. So they're aware of what we're doing to provide safe and state-of-the-art education at the same time. Uh, with regard to our clinical activities, we still have to have clinical activities. But all the patients that are either suspected or known to be COVID positive are geographically located in a separate spot of the hospital. The hospitals and clinics have certain rules that all the students have to adhere to. We provide PPE to all of our students. The students are not knowingly exposed to COVID patients. The medical students are not. But we still treat every patient as if they could possibly be COVID positive. The nursing students have done a perfect job. They still have to care for these patients. They'll still be graduating. It's done in a supervised setting and proper PPE at the same time. Um, I mentioned the communication already. And the last thing is that, again, we're trying to provide both a safe environment and a state of the art. There's a large study that looked at uh, the large major metropolitan areas and determined that between 1 and 7 percent of all the population in every major center, metropolitan center, not health center, have already contracted COVID, whether symptomatic or not. So the issue is not are we going to prevent COVID from being on campus. That's not going to happen. We can't prevent it from being in our cities or in our education efforts. The effort is how do you prevent it and minimize it? And then how do you provide adequate testing when it's necessary, how do you trace when it's necessary, and how do you isolate those individuals. I've talked about how we're educationally preparing. With regard to testing, we're providing on-campus testing with a rapid turnaround, so within 24 hours, those individuals can be determined whether they're actively infected or not. We have a rapid response team that, again, within 24 hours, that traces that individual and every person that could possibly be around them as students, and then isolating those students. They're contacted on a daily basis to find out what their needs are. We picked up prescriptions, delivered to the home, we've delivered food to the home, we've walked dogs, we've done what's ever necessary to make the students' needs are met. So that's how we prepare uh, at Texas Tech El Paso. And I think what you'll hear from the other institutions is because we share this information from many of the common practices we have, we borrow from our sister institutions, we've also shared as well. So, <coughs> thank, you. thank you, Dr. Lane. Any questions for Dr. Lane? Okay, we'll move on to Dr. Russ. At the Texas Tech Health Sciences Center, our team members have been working tirelessly to provide safe learning experiences throughout the summer while also developing plans for more students to return to campus in the fall. Over the summer, students continue to participate in clinical rotations and engage in research activities. Two of our schools also plan to offer in-person academic instruction on campus. Our traditional Bachelor of Science in Nursing program was scheduled to resume classes in July. But then these students experienced a surge in COVID-19 cases prior to coming to campus. Within 24 hours, Dean Evans and his faculty made the decision to keep this program online throughout the summer and worked with students to make the transition successful. Among the challenges confronted by nursing faculty was assisting students in developing the critical thinking and professional skills required to provide safe, quality patient care. Simulation-based experiences assist in the development of these skills but it's difficult to develop these skills in a virtual environment. The simulation program at the HSE provided access to computer-based programs and virtual simulations 
that incorporate, incorporated standardized patients. The HSE simulation program also began working with one of the top international manufacturers of simulators in developing an economical portable skills trainer. And that's what you see in the picture up here. The goal of this trainer was to support the development of essential skills in the safety of the student's home, such as inserting a, nas a nasogastric tube, tracheostomy care, and wound care. The prototype of this product has been developed with input from our HSC nursing faculty and beta testing began, began with 90 nursing students this past week. The HSC School of Nursing is the only testing beta site for this product. The company is committed to have this modular skills trainer available to all nursing schools by the end of August to provide students opportunities to practice and develop essential skills anytime, anywhere. Unlike the nursing school, which remained online this summer, the School of Health Professions was able to execute their plans for providing in-person anatomy instruction to students across multiple academic programs. They had 205 students and 30 faculty and staff on the Lubbock campus every week. Anatomy instruction began in June with online structures four hours per day. Then students spent four hours in lab each starting in July. Faculty members facilitated two sets of lab groups per day to allow for small groups and 25% occupancy in the new space. While many health profession students across the nation are doing video anatomy during this time, our HSC students dissected an entire cadaver as they would have in a full 10-week semester. Our plan compressed the experience into four weeks of dissection. This would not have been possible without the new state-of-art facility and the dedication of our outstanding students, faculty, and staff. With the great success of our summer anatomy courses, now we start our fall anatomy course on Friday, tomorrow, with approximately 210 medical students, 14 teaching assistants, and 12 faculty. Again, what an amazing commitment by our faculty, staff, and to ensure the health and safety of our students. We're happy to report from our so summer program that we did not have one student-to-student -student transmission of COVID-19 during this experience. Thus far, I've described some specific examples of how we've altered academic instruction in response to COVID-19. Now I'd like to give you a more general overview of what fall instruction will look like at our HSC. Academic calendars vary by school, so the HSC will have staggered start dates beginning this week. The semester will conclude by December 18th for all schools, and all schools are prepared to end early if necessary. Each school will offer courses such as a combination of the following, face-to-face, on-campus instruction, synchronous video instruction, and asynchronous online instruction. Of the lecture courses in fall 2020, 23% will be classified face-to-face, 44% will be offered online, and the remaining 33% will be offered via hybrid or interactive video conferencing technology. As of last week, we have uh, approximately 4,500 students currently registering, and we continue to have students register. We're a little bit under our registration from this time last year, uh, but we do have confidence that, that those numbers will continue to grow. Our School of Medicine will remain steady in their enrollment. Our School of Health Professions is expecting a 10% increase. And our remaining schools, Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences, Nursing, and our Jerry H. Hodges School of Pharmacy are expecting small decreases. This may be attributed to a number of factors. For example, in nursing, some of the applicants to the RN to the BSN program and graduate programs are commenting that because of their necessary responses to COVID-19, now is not a good time for them to be in school. For those who will be on campus this fall, all students, faculty, and staff will completely, will daily self participate in self-screening, wear facial coverings, practice physical distancing, and follow recommended hygiene practices. All students will be required to sign the TTUHSC Statement of Student Expectations. This is a document that outlines very clearly student behavior on and off campus and describes protocols for reporting COVID-19 symptoms and exposures and provides key contact information for campus resources. In addition, classroom capacity has been established to no more than 50% capacity and at least six feet between students and instructors. In some cases, meaning both of these parameters resulted in greatly diminished classroom capacity. Throughout the course of the semester, we expect to have anywhere from 230 to 350 students on each of our campus for various reasons including academic instruction, research activities, exams, and skill testing. 
General classrooms and specialized learning laboratories will be cleaned by individual faculty members and our students throughout the day. Our HSC facilities and safety services will ensure each room remains stocked with appropriate supplies. Students and faculty must disinfect their workspaces and necessary equipment both before and after use. The anatomy lab in Lubbock and simulation facilities in Abilene and Carlo, Lubbock and Odessa have established their own cleaning protocols that meet or exceed CDC guidelines. Our housekeeping personnel will coordinate the thoroughly daily cleaning of all instructional and community spaces. For the month of August, our libraries will remain closed in Amarillo, Lubbock and Odessa and this is something that we'll, we will be evaluating monthly depending on student needs and what's happening in the communities we serve. Finally, students will continue to participate in clinical rotations and other community-based experiences in collaboration with participating sites and guidance from program accrediting bodies. As you are aware, we work with 14 different accrediting bodies across the various academic healthcare programs. Students may have, must abide by specific site requirements for personal protection equipment, or PPE, and approximately seven to 500 sites have special PPE requests thus far. But the HSC Office of Institutional Health is working with school representatives to meet the needs of our students. As you can tell, a tremendous amount of work has gone into planning for the small fall semester at the HSC. Our team members have developed countless plans, contingency plans, and contingencies for contingencies. We feel like we have prepared to the extent possible and we have learned from our successes and failures over the spring and summer terms. We have witnessed the fluctuating cases in our campuses, communities, and responded quickly to changing compliance requirements. We don't know exactly what the fall semester will bring, but I'm confident in my team's knowledge, skills, and commitment to make any challenges in accordance with our agency values. And I can't let this moment pass as an HRI without recognizing the tremendous dedication of our faculty and the staff that support them in providing patient care for tens of thousands of patients across the 108 counties we serve. We have many faculty who have been on the front lines in, in serving COVID patients in ICUs, medical ICUs, and their passion and commitment to taking care of West Texans is, should be commended. Thank you very much. Dr. Ross Spear, may I ask one question, please? Yes, you can. What, in light of this disruption on the educational forefront, and without probably exception, most every student under your guise is, has some board certification testing down the road, are you comfortable that even with this disruption, that has not impeded the progress and the educational exposure that's necessary for those board certifications? Bridget Griffin, I'm absolutely confident that we have ensured that our students are well prepared to go out and sit with their license exams. In fact, some of them have already started doing so, and they are performing brilliantly. We also feel like that some of these experiences have, in fact, enhanced some of their learning opportunities by having those things at home, hands-on. They're not having to wait for a term to come to campus and participate in learning. It's there at their home and they're actually doing it on their own time repeatedly. So we're actually hearing that those are some of the positive things coming out of this experience. Thank you. And Regent Griffin, I can comment that I personally received my Step 2 CK score yesterday, which is the second part of the School of Medicine licensing process to become a licensing physician. And from hearing from my classmates as well, um, everyone has felt completely prepared to take their board exams despite the interruptions to education. Good news. Thank yes, you. Certainly. Thank and, you. Um, if I may, real quick, to Dr. Lang and Dr. Rice Dearman, I just want to say thank you for your dedication to ensuring a safe clinical learning environment. And I say that very personally because I'm in that stage of learning myself right now. And I have this firsthand witness that even though we can read about these clinical issues, we can practice on all the models, but only through on site and firsthand experience. Can we truly learn how to take care of people, which is really what we're in this to do? So, I'm just going to say thank you for all the work that you've done. Thank you, thank you for the comments. Any other questions for Dr. Ross Spearman? Okay, we're going to um, turn it over to Angie for ASU. So, one of the things that we had to do on our campus is we continue to try to balance um, safety with cost. We don't want to skimp any 
on any of the safety measures for our faculty, staff, and students, but uh, being a smaller institution, cost has certainly come into play on this. You'll see examples of our signage that we have everywhere. Um, the picture up on the top right is our risk management, director of emergency and risk management. And that's one of the machines that we bought so that we could quickly spray down any area. All of our classrooms are sprayed weekly with this, but we're using that same machine in our faculty and staff, and some of our student employees are actually spraying the equipment in like our VREC area, our athlete training areas and weightlifting areas, and that was to keep the cost down rather than have to outsource that. We've just bought these machines, and I've watched them spray. It's amazing how fast you can cover an area with that machine. Um, one of the other things that we've done, uh, the bottom right hand, you can see, it, it's kind of hard to see it, but that's actually a picture of the acrylic screens that have gone between the students. The cost to purchase those received a little high to us, and so the, the guys out in our carpenter shop actually made all of the acrylic partitions that we've put in front of our office coordinators and in the labs and all of these areas. So that was just another way we could internalize and still save some costs, but yet keep our faculty, staff, and students safe. One picture I was not able to um, get and put a, provide for them to put up there. Um, you know, when we this first happened, one of the things, you'll see this everywhere you go, water fountains is one of the things that we've had to basically turn off. Some of our water fountains don't turn off. So our very efficient facility guys put black trash bags over all of them. And it was very efficient and it kept all the students safe. But one of our project managers saw that and went, you know, that's really not very pretty. And so she's organized a team of women out in the wall community. They're going to sew covers to go over our, uh, basically block our water fountains to keep everybody safe and yet not have the ugly black trash bags sitting on top of them. So just another example of how the Rand family really bonds together and works together as a team. What I really want to talk about though, because what's most important, the reason we're talking about all this and why we're here is we want to bring our students back to campus. And so the most important thing that we've worked on throughout the summer is how do we have face-to-face -face courses and keep not only our students, but our faculty safe in those environments. Um, so what we've done, we have approximately 140 academic classrooms um, that deliver face-to-face -face classes. During the COVID pandemic, a classroom technology work group was formed to address classroom technology needs for the fall semester to support social distancing requirements and accommodations for those students that may need to receive instruction from a remote location. This work group consisted of faculty members, deans, instructional designers, and information technology personnel. This work group was charged with the goal of finding a tech, with the goal of defining a technology solution that is simple to use for the faculty member and the student, that is flexible for student for teaching methods and easily consumable by a student. Budget friendly, again, you know, got a CFO as the interim president, it's gotta be budget friendly. Um, and leveraging the existing campus solutions like Blackboard and Collaborate. But most importantly, it had to be able to be installed in every classroom before the fall semester began because all the best technology isn't going to work if you don't actually have it in the classrooms. Um, during the COVID situation, each classroom has been equipped with a webcam, tripod, wide range mic to provide a flexible teaching and learning environment. This is addition to any other equipment that was already existing within the classrooms. The equipment set up in each classroom will accommodate both synchronous and asynchronous learning depending on the faculty teaching style and class composition and delivery method. Each class section will have the ability to be recorded for students to review as needed. And again, all the technology in the world doesn't do anything if people don't know how to use the technology. So in addition to providing all this, we've also trained both our students and our faculty that needed a little help in being able to use the, the newer technology that was being installed. Um, as of yesterday, we had 14,258, I say students, but it was logins, student logins, um, that participated in the self-paced, self-help student support course in Blackboard so they could learn how to use the Blackboard courses. This is between April and July. Um, we have trained 25 faculty members to be the train-the-trainer model, so that way we don't have just the, the four or five staff um, that typically train for this kind of thing, having to train all of our faculty. So we've trained 25 faculty members for a train-the-trainer model to use the new classroom technology. And at the same time, we also created a how-to-use training video documentation, and it was accessed 104 times by faculty as of July the 26th. 
and 288 faculty participated in online training courses on how to use Blackboard and learning tools. Again, you know, even for our face-to-face -face courses, we have to be ready to accommodate a student who may not be able to come to class that particular day. All of our faculty are ready and willing to help those students who may have to miss classes for a week or two at a time. Um, in addition to this, we also provide a checklist and quick access documentation that's been created and placed in each classroom. Faculty can also use an interim phone to call this Technology Services Center in the event that they have technical difficulties so they don't end up ending their class if they can't figure out how to work something. They can get immediate help and we do have staff that will be on standby ready to help, especially those first couple of weeks. Uh, this same documentation has been provided to the Technology Service Center so they can troubleshoot quickly in any of the classroom setups. Technicians will be validating that equipment in each classroom prior to the fall semester so that we're sure it works. And even as we're doing this, you know, I, as, um, I think it was John Simon, uh, Regent Simon said, I would hate to be the technology guy. In the first two weeks of class, our technology department will be um, fairly busy. Um, we've also assigned technicians to each of the academic buildings the first few weeks of class so they can respond quickly if they need to physically go in and help the faculty member. Um, this is just some of the many things. These are just the ones I wanted to touch on because as each of the four presidents provides us, we've all worked collaborative, collaboratively together and so we're all taking ideas from each other and I was very thankful for <coughs> the guidance and the wisdom from these guys who've been helping me this summer to get us ready. Um, if we'll move on to athletics, so we spent quite a bit of time this summer preparing for summer athletics. We were able during the summer to allow our athletes back on campus to practice without their coaches volunteer, or with their coaches but voluntarily. And here's some pictures of them working. They, we did the temperature scanning, they um, were masked while they were working. They are very anxious to be able to play. Um, unfortunately, the rules are changing. We've talked about how fluid we have to be during this pandemic. And yesterday, I received a statement um, last night. And so even as, I basically just thrown out all my notes for um, this session of my topic. Because yesterday, an email came out, NCAA Division II championships and fall sports for the 2021 academic year have been canceled due to the continuing COVID-19 pandemic and the related administrative and financial challenges of hosting the fall championships at any point in the upcoming academic year. So we've just been told that, that the NCAA is not going to have our fall championships. Now our student athletes, they still want to play. And so tomorrow I'll have a meeting with the Lone Star Conference presidents to see if there are other things that we can do to continue to allow our athletes to play, um, possibly even simply just having a conference championship for our student athletes. One of the things I wanted to be sure I mentioned, after one of the president's um, uh, meetings for the Lone Star Conference, they asked us to all go back to our campuses and see, was there anything that um, we had concerns about did everybody want to play or was it just the ADs that wanted the students? So I met with the deans and um, when I was meeting with the deans via a Zoom and asking them how did they feel about our student athletes playing, were they concerned about the athletes being in the, in the classrooms? The two comments that stood out to me the most was they felt like that our student athletes will be more academically successful if they are allowed to play. And the other one, it, you know, kind of made me giggle, but it, it probably is a little true. One of the deans made the comment, you know, every time we meet, we can't all agree on everything. There's six deans. And if you said today was Thursday, somebody in the room would not be able to agree with that statement. But we all agree that our student athletes are academically more successful and will actually stand a better chance of avoiding um, getting the virus if they are following the guidelines that they would have to follow to be in our um, training sessions. During the summer, we had several camps on our campus involving our student athletes and youth on our campus. And today, no act, there was no athlete-to-athlete -athlete transmission of COVID, although there were a few cases um, at a couple of the camps and one of our football players. Um, and that's all that I have for this session. Any questions for Angie and AC? So you're saying Division II sports are put on hold by the NCAA because they don't have quite the TV? The, yeah, the championships have been canceled. 
championships have been canceled. I believe, and I'll look more tomorrow when I meet tomorrow, that uh, we may still be able to play, but we will not be playing for a national championship for all sports. How many games have been canceled? Uh, the, the last time I heard the schedule, we have seven games scheduled for our football games. Um, we still have a couple of institutions within our conference in New Mexico that there's concerns about being able to travel. There was a lot of discussion on being able to maybe, to be sure you had the seven or eight games you needed to have a conference champion, we could even play each other twice if we needed to. So at this point, I really just don't know where we are, but hopefully I'll know more tomorrow. The Canada game was canceled though, right? Yes, sir, the Canada yeah. game, we canceled that quite a while ago. We yeah. didn't feel like there was any way we would be able to transfer the team to Canada and back. Maybe you can take them to Canadian. <laughs> 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 we'll get grappled with you on that. Any other questions for NG or ASU? Okay, we're going to move on to Texas Tech, but before we do, I um, have a little I have a true story about Dr. Stupinak. In one of our very first meetings, uh, when we were talking about communications and COVID 19, I said to Dr. Stupinak, I said, I am so tired of reading your emails. You have to do a video. All our other presidents are doing videos. You need to do videos. You need to have your face in front of the constituents. And he would say, I'm horrible at videos. I don't do very good at videos. I like emails. I don't want to do a video. So we bantered and went back and forth for some time. And he walked out of the office. He said, fine, can you all do whatever? Just tell me what to do. I was like, perfect. That's always a good answer. <laughs> Since then, he has been on CNN, Fox. He's done like 300 videos. So I am adding a title to my um, job description as talent agent for President Scuba You can't even have lunch with him anymore. You have to call his people. <laughs> Thank you, Kendra. Actually, I did do some videos. <laughs> but when you have this kind of voice, you just don't want to do that. <laughs> um, Thank you. Um, in my comments today, I am going to begin with communication. Talk a bit about academic instruction, uh, student and campus life, and then overall uh, health and safety. Like each of the components, uh, we've all realized that communication has been essential. Communication and planning. So just as we were beginning to shut down, we began to plan to open. And that involved communicating what we were doing to faculty, staff, and parents. Um, at our office, we've issued 58 different memos. That's not counting the communications that come from other units. Starting in early March, our most recent communication was yesterday regarding uh, issues of fees. Um, I've communicated regularly with the Texas Tech Parent Association. I appreciate the work of their president, Troy Sackman. Um, and with the faculty and staff, as we plan for the fall offerings, the provost convened a committee of faculty and staff and students making recommendations that went to departments and colleges, and then they came up with the agenda for course offerings um, this fall. Uh, there has been, I think, some positive outcomes of this communication in terms of the visibility of Texas Tech, and we have really tried to take advantage of the public service announcement along with an opportunity to promote the university. As you saw in that Be a Mass writer that's been posted around the state, it's a public service announcement, but also it's an attractor to Texas Tech. Um, and that's also been the case with these, um, these, these appearances on these other venues. But at the core of our communication has been the Texas Tech commitment. And I really hope that you would take the time to go just Google Texas Tech commitment and you'll see videos. We do one video a week. And uh, the best ones are those of which I have a minimal part. Um, but it really does speak to the broad, expansive plan as it relates to academic instruction, campus life, housing, dining, transportation, and so on and so forth. And uh, what we'll be giving every student when they show up on campus will be this little bag. We'd be glad to give you one. Inside, you'll find a mask, <clears throat> sanitization, wipes, and such, and they'll all be provided this. It's, and it's, it's labeled a Texas Tech commitment. Um, 
I, I think it's important to also emphasize that the communication has not always just been about COVID-19 and our planning. But the Office of Admissions and Enrollment Management has really had to step up their game in terms of reaching out to parents and students. I asked Jimmy Hanser this morning to give me the latest data. Um, <clears throat> over the summer, they've conducted 22 virtual events reaching out to more than five, about 5,000 families. Um, she said that they have mailed since March more than 5.3 million emails. That compares to 3.3 million last year. They've sent out 446,000 pieces of printed material compared to 255,000. And I think one of the benefits of that is showing in our enrollment numbers. As of Monday, the Key West report showed we were up 5% overall, but for freshmen, we're up 9.7. Now, I would hasten to add that we have two weeks to go, and those numbers may not hold. There's a lot of issues we're dealing with. But I think the communication has, and the fact that we're offering uh, mixed modalities has been important. So let me turn to academic instruction. As each of my colleagues has already commented on, we are offering instruction through three modalities, online, face-to-face, -face, and hybrid. Um, as of today, 61% uh, of our offerings um, have either fully face-to-face -face or some degree of face-to-face. -face. Among freshman courses, it's 74%. Now those numbers are down 4 to 5% from where they were a month ago, and, and that reflects anxiety in our desire to respect apprehensions of faculty and staff. But starting in the last week or so, we have put additional resources into offering additional face-to-face -face and online to make sure we can put the students in the, class, the kind of classes they want. Um, and as everyone has already mentioned, um, the, the, the online is a form of hybrid, sometimes it's called flipping, you access materials before you show up, synchronous and asynchronous. But we're trying to emphasize that through these virtual modalities, you offer plenty of opportunities for students to have op uh, office hours with students in personal interactions. Um, one thing we've done just recently is um, announced that we're going to have outdoor classrooms. One big one is going to be on the engineering key. We're doing additional ones. There will be Wi-Fi facilities in there. Um, and um, we're also trying to communicate to students that even if you're online, you can go to those outdoor environments and interact with other students and faculty. Um, in the classrooms themselves, we're keeping the front rows empty. Uh, there's plexiglass. If the instructor wants to separate them from the uh, student body. And, and also, and I alluded to this in my comments on face masks, there are very specific instructions being given to faculty as to how you conduct the first day of class. We've asked faculty to communicate one week in advance to all students through email to let them know about what protocols will have to be observed as to how you queue into a classroom, seating arrangements, and so on and so forth. Uh, I'll now turn to student and campus life. Um, so we have extended uh, in the dorms um, the time for move-in from the traditional one weekend to three weeks. Um, and in, we've made a number of changes in dining facilities um, I imagine all institutions are. Uh, we're only going to use, we're only going to use dis uh, disposable plateware and silverware. We removed self-service stations. Um, all grab-and-go food items will be individually wrapped. And we're, we're encouraging all customers to download the Grub Hub app and use it for ordering and we're installing kiosks where we think that will help. Um, among hospitality crews, they've been put into crews so that if somebody tests positive or becomes ill, we pull the whole crew. We'll have another crew come in to replace them. Uh, in terms of sanitization in general, um, Billy alluded to the uh, filtering, uh, 
the character filtering, but other things we're doing is very similar to other schools. We educated staff on enhanced cleaning mechanisms. Uh, we're so. using uh, electrostatic application, sanitizers when um, yeah. the yeah. rooms are not yeah. occupied. Again, so. um, the, 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 uh, we've installed wellness stations okay. in buildings where yeah, students so. and yeah. faculty and staff can access hand sanitizers, sanitizing wipes, <coughs> disposable masks, and so on. But uh, what you'll see there in the video is that happens to be the rec center that's in dining. There's been a tremendous amount of effort put into making sure everything has, is as clean as it can be in the dorms and the dining facilities. We've reduced the capacity in the dorms 6%. Um, we have reserved 20 camp apartments on campus where we can provide a place for students to go when they need to be isolated. We've made arrangements with 20 apartment units in the city. And we've also negotiated uh, for 40 hotel rooms where we can place students if we need to provide that kind of space. And of course, the opportunity is to get even more. Um, and the direct center is going to be open at 50% capacity. I go there regularly. I think they're doing a very good job of um, making sure everything is clean, making sure that they're wearing their masks. Um, in, in, in terms of the campus life, I think I should also mention some of the activities that we generally do. We understand that students are coming back because they want somewhat of a normal experience. So we will be moving forward with uh, some red sports activities, uh, Greek life. Um, they've been conducting um, weekly Zoom meetings uh, during the summer to prepare them for the, what was a virtual rush experience. There will be some basic activities once school actually starts. But we're going to do everything we can. When I listen to what parents tell me and what students tell me, I believe one reason our enrollment numbers are what they are is they want as much as possible to have a face-to-face -face experience. And that's what we're going to try to provide. And to, uh, there are, I've mentioned already some of the general health and safety policies that apply to these various activities. But um, in addition, as has already been mentioned, we are providing free testing in conjunction with the Texas Department of Emergency um, Management. Uh, thus far, uh, this week, they've conducted 650 tests. 2% have been positive, but it's going very well. And I think that covers the uh, essential points uh, that I wanted to make. And Kendra, should I move into sports or athletics. do they have questions? I mean, I mean, if they have questions on the academic side, if not, we'll move into athletics. Um, so Kirby uh, couldn't be here right now, so I'm going to provide the comments that he intended to make. So um, Texas Tech Athletics revealed, unveiled this return to campus plan in June as part of the first steps of athletes coming back for voluntary workouts. The dates for that were established in conjunction with uh, directives from the Big 12 as well as the NCAA. And they've done extensive testing to date. Texas Tech Athletics, Athletics has administered uh, more than 500 tests. Uh, they have daily screening procedures uh, as students come in to work out very stringent requirements as to what they do when they're at certain stations. They do wear their face coverings during workouts and even lifting weights. They have sanitized all weight room equipment and heavily trafficked areas. And um, they do have accommodations for those athletes that test positive. Um, as you probably know, and you saw this week in the media, the Big 12 did decide to go to a nine plus one, that's nine conference games, one non-conference game, with the understanding that that would be a home game to help us fulfill our obligation to Fox and ESPN. That would provide 55 games. We were originally obligated for 57, so it would be a very minor loss of revenue. Um, the conference will start either on the 19th or 26th of September, and the conference championship will probably be pushed back to allow more flexibility for open dates. Um, 
There's an expectation that anybody we play will have the same testing protocols that the Big 12 does. Everybody will be tested three days for an event. And I failed to mention in terms of the turnaround, we've been getting two-day turnaround on the TDEM testing over there at the museum. So and that's, we'll have the same kind of turnaround for athletics. Um, and with that, I'll just take any questions you have. Okay. Any questions for Lawrence? I think um, Chancellor Mitchell, do you want to wrap this up? So there's this old boy. Me and a bunch of his buddies were going out <laughs> on a Saturday night with the bar way out on this dusty road, and uh, one of the fellas was going outside to uh, go to the outhouse. And he came running back in the bar and he's yelling, Bubba, Bubba, somebody has stolen your truck. And Bubba looked at him and said, you got to be kidding me. Did you get a look at who it was? He said, no, no, don't worry. I wrote down the license plate. One of the things that has happened uh, over the last several months is that there are a gazillion different balls in the air when it comes to this COVID-19 thing. When, when uh, Deputy Chancellor Burris is talking about the fact that we've had people meeting on a regular basis, Quite literally, seven days a week, there's been somebody meeting about something. We've been steeped in this uh, for that period of time. The reason being, with something like this, that is this complicated, that has this many things going on, you have got to be able to focus on the important things and not the peripheral things. John Kennedy said too often, we enjoy the comfort of opinion without the dif discomfort of thought. And when you talk about COVID-19, there's a lot of that going around. Uh, if you think about opening schools or not opening schools, it's enticing for folks to, to make this a binary choice. You're either virtuous, you don't want people to get sick, so you're voting to keep them closed, or you're all about the money, so you're wanting to keep them, go ahead and open. Well, it's not a binary choice at all. This is something that, uh, that you have to put a lot of thought into, and the folks that we've had working on this, uh, Dr. Lang may mention this, this is the strength of being a system. And being a system that has health-related institutions has made this as functional uh, a setting as you could have for trying to determine how and when to reopen. Uh, because this requires a lot of people making decisions very often with limited data. And so for folks that, friends of ours, that as we look through the pros and cons of everything, there are two questions that I think are paramount for everybody to consider when you're being asked questions, when we're being asked questions about reopening. For parents, for students, for the public, and, and, and the like. Uh, two very important questions. One, one question is, when will we be past beyond coronavirus? Is it going to be at the end of this semester? Is it going to be at the end of this academic year? Is it going to be two years from now? The answer is, we don't know. We have no earthly idea about when we're going to be beyond this virus. Therefore, what are we waiting on? We have got to start learning to live in a coronavirus world with this. Because the second question that is as important is who is most disadvantaged by not reopening? Ross Ramsey had a great article in Texas Review back in April. And he was looking at uh, access to broadband. One third of Texas households don't have broadband. For any of this to work, that all of the presidents have been discussing requires broadband. You want to guess who the one third of families that don't have broadband are? They're rural families, they're families in inner cities, they're lower socioeconomic families. So the very people that we are trying to provide an education to, to help them in life, are the people that we are placing a disadvantage by not reopening. 
So what we do is we try to go through every single scenario that we can fully realize, fully realizing Number one, we can't cover every scenario. Number two, somebody's gonna get sick. Period, end of story. With regard to the first, we have these rapid response teams on all of our campuses, made up of the experts that know the answers. So that if a student, a staff member, a faculty member has an issue in real time, there's somebody they can talk to about it right then and there. With regards to being able to uh, respond for the students and to, uh, to give them an environment that is as protected as possible. We've had not only the folks within our, our system working on this, but we are following, not just following CDC guidelines and the government's guidelines with this, we're exceeding them in most areas. So we look at this uh, with the template of would we have our own children uh, in this environment? The answer is yes, we would. We absolutely would. So there are going to be things that happen. There are going to be issues that arise that we haven't thought about, but we've got great people in place to make this thing work. And we want to, first and foremost, provide an environment that is as effective for curricular delivery as it can be, and as effective for protecting people as it can be. And what we have to understand collectively is that to an extent, our country right now with things has this historical myopia in that we are blessed because we're the victims of our own success with vaccinations and modern medicine. We, we collectively really don't remember what it's like to have pandemics flow through. Our parents knew, our grandparents knew, and they knew how to live with it, we don't. I do remember as a kid, a classmate of mine that had polio and was crippled from it. Uh, but that is in my distant memory. So we have got to learn the ways that we engage with one another. We have to protect those amongst us that are the most vulnerable. And we take this approach of, of a, a term that actually came up during the AIDS crisis, universal precaution. Because we don't know everything about it, we take universal Cautions. If you go around the campus assuming everybody you're going to bump into may have been exposed to coronavirus, that dictates your actions. And it dictates the way we clean the place, it dictates the way that we handle the air, it dictates the way that we engage with one another, but we do this uh, still following our missions as universities. So the work that's been put in is incredible. And we have, uh, we've had our beta tests on campuses where some students have been back working out some of the kinks. So we are as ready as we can be and I could not be more proud of the work that our teams have done. That's all, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I, um, I'd like to echo uh, what our Chancellor just, just said. I've, I've had the privilege of talking uh, every night to them since March 15th. Uh, we've got incredible leadership. They will need counseling probably for all the talking they've done to me. Uh, but I want to say something we've done. This, what you have seen is the tip of tremendous depth of work, details, and preparation. And this was a very small snapshot of that. That said, when we all go back, it's not going to be perfect. I 100% guarantee you it's not going to be perfect, but there are systems in place to respond, and I think that's what we all should expect, uh, and we should prepare for that very thing. So thank you all for the work that you've done, uh, and for the work that you are going to do, because there's a lot of work in front of us, but it's the right work, so thank you for that. Mr. Kramer, if you will please present item two regarding the naming of the engineering student hub. Well, I have a quick story. No. <laughs> we'll jump right into it. We'll get a, a slide pulled up real quick. Working and, and 
part of our American culture as we continue to move through this virus. So we wanted to highlight a particular gift um, and naming during this um, Board of Regents meeting. So there's an entity here we're looking for the approval of the naming of the Engineering Student Hub, um, the American Electric Power Foundation Engineering Student Hub at Angelo State University. And I'll go through a couple slides of where this is located. Um, so it's on the Angelo campus. It's in the Vincent building, located there right there in the middle of campus. And then this is the schematic that we have for um, the actual construction of this student hub. Um, when I say philanthropy is, is live and well, this is a great organization that we have. But on behalf of Jamie Aiken and the development staff at ASU, um, I've got some comments about this entity, the foundation, the Electric Power Foundation, or American Electric Power Foundation, um, is funding normally across the country with STEM education from early childhood to higher ed. Um, they also look at basic human services needs within the communities for which they support. So again, a very charitable group um, across the country. Um, the donors based in Columbus, Ohio, and um, this is just another example of when we look at what Texas Tech University can do, the system, Angelo State University, um, we're happy that we have donors from across the country. This donation actually puts the, the foundation over $1.5 million worth of giving to the university, to the system, and to Angelo State University. So again, one of those things that we love to show the power of philanthropy. They've been doing this since 1994. So they're not a new donor to the system, they just continue to give. Um, so this is really a testament to Angelo State University, how it impacts the region, how it impacts the country, and their close relationship with this foundation as well as engineering and TTU as well. The other significant thing about this is this gift covers 100% of the renovation costs or cost of construction. And we always love to see gifts that can actually do that. So at this point in time, we're looking to approve the naming of the Engineering Student Hub at um, Angelo State University. The American Electric Power Foundation Engineering Student Hub would be the name that's on there. Um, that hub is located on the second floor of the Vincent Building for Engineering. Um, the donor concurs with the naming of the space, um, and the signage of the space will specify the approved name. So Mr. Chairman, looking for your approval. Any questions or comments related to this item? If not, do I hear a motion to approve? Motion. Second. A motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank Great. You much. Just one quick recognition. You know, we started the Red Raider Response Fund, which was really done via email and then social media as well as this social online giving platform and the recognition of about 365 donors that answered the call needs to be recognized. We've done $184,000 um, since the beginning of COVID-19 to the present. Some of you are donors to that fund, so thank you everyone for contributing to it. But it's another effort of our Red Raider family and how strong we are together. So thank you everyone that contributed. Thank you. Mr. Breedlove, please present item number three regarding the proposed increase in total project budget for the ASU uh, Mayor Museum project. I need to use two webs at the front. We're going to go at uh, making long speed here, to I know we're a little bit behind the schedule, um, but the, the item I'm going to discuss today is for ASU. And that's to authorize the increase in the total budget for the Angelo State University Meyer Museum project. This is a project we've talked about numerous times. There's a site uh, where the museum is located. Just an uh, artist rendering and, and show again on the site plan. So this is the first floor. There's really not a, a lot of things happening on the first floor. I will say that we are reaching substantial completion this month on this project at the end of August. But adding this mezzanine, if it's approved today, we'll, we'll push that back a little bit. You can see the mezzanine expansion there. As the building was nearing completion, um, the donor, the Myers, came out and some other San Angelo community folks and expressed the need for more exhibit space. Hence why we have this mezzanine expansion that we're looking at. Uh, the scope of the project is outlined in red. Like I said, the, the original substantial completion is the end of this month. Uh, FFD is gonna start moving in September 1. 
with the new set substantial completion of this mezzanine would push out to January of 2021. Now I will say this at the, I guess the yellow to the right, that space, if ASU chooses, they can occupy that space and use it for its intended purpose. Uh, we want to leave that up to those folks to see. So the project overview is a 1,007 square foot mezzanine extension for additional exhibit space within the new Angelo State University Meyer Museum. The additional space is donor funded. Uh, it's currently under construction. The 32,005 gross square foot facility will support the same, the same programs that we've talked about before. Uh, the Bachelor of Arts uh, program at Studio Art. We've got the Angelo State University Ceramic Symposium and West Texas Plus. So the project budget is $750,000. You can see the, the breakout there, the majority of that being in construction and arts and professional services for architectural structural engineering uh, work and some uh, changes to the interior space for a revised budget of $17,850,000. So the recommendations approve the budget increase $750,000 for a total of $17.85 million in order to expand the mezzanine for additional exhibit space within the National State University of Meyer Museum. Accept the increase of the guaranteed maximum price for a contractor, amend the design professional agreement, and amend the construction manager risk agreement. The new authorized increase will be funded with gifts. The project will be funded through the revenue finance system, we pay with gifts and HEF, and the HEF funds are uh, in line with the prorated square footage of the space, which uh, Angela State has proven. So, Mr. Chairman, that is the recommendation. Any questions for Billy regarding this item? If not, do I hear a motion to approve? Motion. Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say sign. Motion carries. Billy, please present item number four of the report on construction project. Yes, sir. Just want to give a report on a few projects and a little update on COVID 19 the impacts that we're having. Um, you can see the positive COVID cases that we have on the left side of the graph. That's actually changed since we uh, printed this. We've added two more COVID cases, both in El Paso. One on the World Health Clinic and the other on the Medical Science Building 2. Medical Science Building 2, we lost an entire crew of um, people that were out there doing HVAC controls. 14 men left the project. Um, they're starting to trickle back now, but they just, they just pulled out. Um, we also have some known delays on the right. None of those are really new to what we've talked about in the past when I've given reports. Still issues with elevators, flooring. Um, some furniture manufacturing that was shut down. We were delayed to get some of our FF and E on site. Uh, MEP, plumbing equipment delays. And then, like I said, the quarantine of loss of entire crews due to COVID and some project shutdowns. It's hard sometimes to get some folks back. So, I want to touch base. We've been talking about med medical science building two in El Paso for some time. This week, the design team, Sun Broad Associates, um, HSC El Paso facilities guys were. Uh, they conducted punch lists and building reviews to determine if the building was substantially complete or close. There's some items that uh, we're not going to let go uh, to get substantial. Some of those are, there's a few life safety issues. There's some, the lighting controls. Like I said, we're delayed because the crew can't get there. Uh, security, there's some security that needs to be reviewed by the police department there. And then we've got some emergency generator testing and, and some access issues that we're working through. I'll be out there next week um, looking at the project, reviewing it again. We're not going to grant substantial until HSC El Paso facilities folks are comfortable with us handing over that building. We are looking at two different uh, substantial completions, one for the interior and one for the exterior. And the reason being the exterior has a very large public art piece that's being integrated into the landscaping. It was delayed because of COVID, and so it's therefore thrown the entire landscaping package a little bit behind. We think it's probably about a month. <coughs> the FF&E, um, the majority of the FF&E is on site. Um, about Probably about 75 to 80 percent is stored in the shell space of this building. Um, it'll take um, probably about six, seven weeks to get it all done, but we already actually already have some of it done, as you can see there. That's the auditorium space. We've talked about the skyfold folding partition that goes right down the middle of that space. That's manufactured in Canada, and we are delayed there probably till the end of August to get that in. But the space can be divided up. Um, there's a flat classroom that the person standing on taking a picture can be divided in multiple ways. So there's the, the money on that, nothing's changed. I wanted to talk about Weeks Hall. We reached substantial completion on July 6th for this facility. 
Um, I know this has been a, a topic for many, many years on the Board of Regents and with Texas Tech, working with Noah Sloan and Dr. Skubinak. We, we think we've got a beautiful project there. I know they've kind of been through there um, just recently, but you can see the FFDs going in. This, this building will um, house 12 different departments. Some of those are the ROTC, Student Disability Services, Human Sciences, uh, Grad Center, some math and climate sciences also. So this, this project turned out pretty good. We did have some COVID delays on that, but we still managed to get, uh, get it done by July 6th. Uh, the interior artwork is being fed in, in, in production right now and also be installed here in the near future. <laughs> Nothing's changed there. That's Norman Marble Basketball Center. I hope you got to drive by it um, on the way here. The top left is the east facade. Um, looking at the main entrance, if you're standing at the United Spirit Arena. I will say that the stone now, um, you can see the blue air barrier that's there. I uh, saw so I'm putting up some stone pieces there yesterday. We were delayed a little bit. We had have, we have about six more orders coming out of Oklahoma for stone. We're getting three this week, three next week, which will make it about 100%. The top right picture is the nutritional area. The flooring's down, it's just covered up for protection. Uh, the bottom left is another picture of the facade there. And then on the bottom right is, is one of the two hydrotherapy pools. Um, since then, they've, they've tiled it and um, we'll have some branding packages that go along with that also. This is, um, so a couple other views in the weight room. I think it's a 4,000 square foot weight, weight room on the top left. On the top right, you've got the men's basketball facility, and then on the bottom left, the women's. And then you can also see on the bottom right some of the furniture that's being moved into the facility. The middle picture is actually on the second floor in the shared team lounge looking back towards the USA. And that, I think Indiana Avenue will open today uh, for student movement tomorrow. So we've got brick papers there and all. And also, uh, some beautiful light fixtures that's going to go in the lobby. We made some changes just recently to that. So um, the lobby is going to be uh, super cool and um, the team's done great on that. And the design professionals and some other inputs uh, have really made that a beautiful space. We're also in the process of signing off on the branding package right now. We issued that for sign off. There's a lot that goes into the branding package. You've got men and women's basketball that, that each have their own opinions and, and wants and needs. And so we tried to do that. And we've made a few changes here and there, but the branding package is really looking super. Wall padding's going in, scoreboard's going in. Uh, we'll be ready to get a team in there soon. So this is a little bit of the movement of the money here. Uh, we are moving every penny we can find in any of the line items up to construction. Uh, it's also for some branding. Uh, to finish the project, so um, money's been moved there, but we're okay. Dairy barn, I'm not sure if anybody's gone by the dairy barn while you're in town, but it's starting to take some, some pretty good shape here. Um, we're gonna finish the end of August on this. The top left is the west elevation. The top right is the conference room. Now what we did was, uh, you can see the feed board that's there for the wainscot. That was actually the bead board that went in the ceiling for the structure. Um, there was uh, quite a bit of that. We removed that. Um, we refinished it. We actually used it inside the building. So the bottom left, you can see a little bit more of the bead board there. And on the on the bottom right, you can actually see that's the milking area um, that was in the dairy barn and how that bead board looked back in the day. So um, that's kind of, we tried to use any material that we could that was old and, and uh, Maybe it couldn't be reused for its intended purposes. Um, the middle office there, as you see, that's that dark wood is actually, that came off the second floor of the dairy barn. So you had your, your basic, um, uh, I guess, plywood deck, and then you had uh, that batten board there for finished wood. Um, we salvaged what we could and actually put it into a wall so you can see that. The windows are going in, um, they've been refurbished or rebuilt back to the original dairy barn look. Flooring starts next week, landscaping, hardscaping is next week. Had a little delay because of the rain we got, which we desperately needed. There's some exterior stucco work going on. Lights are going in, ceiling grids in. You can see the top floor on the bottom left. Things really turned out quick. There again, no money going up there. I wanted to show just the USDA cotton classing laboratory. This is just a reminder, this kind of gets missed a little bit. This is a, a, a project that Dr. Skubinak and the federal government, USDA, worked in, in uh, 
conjunction with to put this on our, our campus. This is located across from Rawls uh, Golf Course. Um, the FPNC team is providing project management and construction observation duties on this project for the federal government. Um, you can see the, the top left is a large uh, conveyor that goes under the ground of the classing office. That's how they're going to move their, their lint and their cotton to the bell press. Uh, we've got an IT room on the bottom left and then just on, on the right side is just showing the building pad, utility work, foundations and footings. I want to touch base a little bit on, on vegetable too. This is the last project I want to just kind of brief you on. Um, this is a this is an older photo. This is in really where we are today, but it was a drone photo that I wanted to kind of show the footprint. Um, if you can remember the sim centers on the top left, the trailers, construction trailers on the left. The the this part on, on the left side where the classrooms and offices are, that has now been poured with concrete and the steel is standing. So the uh, majority of the steel, there's 26 different sequences of steel on this project. Um, we are pouring second floors for above grade flooring. Um, the roofing starts um, here pretty quick, I think in a week or two. MEP rough ends ongoing. Brakes actually going to start going up next week. Um, exterior studs are going up, and we also have some of our exterior jet board there. So that's really taking shape. And there's a few photos of it. Been really blessed with good weather up there. And then the last last uh, slide I wanted to show you. This is the Mariposa site. You can see the main road coming in from the loop that will go back to the Mariposa site. And then on the bottom right, part of the ten acres um, we we're building the pads. Um, just getting ready to start running the utilities there. A lot of dirt work took place up there, but we're making good progress there too. So that's the Mariposa site. In Mr. Chairman, that's all I had, unless somebody has some specific questions about projects. Any questions? Comments from Billy? Ms. Freelock, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Barnes, please present item number five regarding the fiscal year 2021 uh, operating budgets for the system. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We're queuing up the uh, presentation, but let me take just a minute to Thank you and the rest of the board members for the time that you spent of your schedule to talk with uh, each of the CFOs with regards to the development of our budget. Um, the presidents have articulated much of the planning that has gone into open the uh, academic year. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity that we had to visit with you. We appreciate your guidance, your comments, your questions with regards to our budget process. Um, as has been described uh, earlier today, this is a very fluid situation. Um, what we have presented in our budget is certainly not a doomsday projection. It is not a very overly optimistic projection. It's a very conservative projection um, and very realistic. Um, let me pause for just a moment and get our PowerPoint queued up. Looking for the PowerPoint, I think that you have material that was on diligence. I think I'll just move forward with that. If that's all right with you, Mr. Chair. While we have been focused on all the planning um, that have been um, surrounding our COVID 19, Chancellor and the Presidents uh, continue to uh, have a focus on our commitment to our core mission to pursue excellence, teaching, research, and healthcare and outreach. Um, we have continued to develop our plans with regards to our reopening. Our budget includes the directive from the governor's office issued on May the 20th to reduce 5% of our budget uh, from the 86th legislative session. We have developed budget strategies for the conservative enrollment projection that all the institutions 
the various uh, colleges and professional programs, as well as particularly the um, hospital revenues and the uh, medical practice income plan at our health science centers. We have implemented um, various budget uh, reductions. Um, we reduced travel, non-essential expenditures. We have the, the deferred capital expenditures. We restructured debt, and we have developed various salary scenarios. So again, our, our budget includes all of these things. Um, we have developed a good number of scenarios to try to anticipate um, different events that the COVID disruption um, could have and could bring to us uh, with regards to different type of uh, educational delivery platform, uh, different models with regards to um, reduction in our um, coverage, whether that would be in our classrooms, uh, dormitories, athletic events, student center, and rec center. Um, and your information on page three is our uh, request for our budget for FY21. The budget request is $2,186,306,605. So $40 million reduction or almost 2%. Might take just a moment to mention a couple of the variances with regards to the estimated income on this page. Tuition and fees increased 1.4%, a very modest increase. Two variables on that was the increase in the tuition and fee rates. Okay. Tuition and fee rates uh, that was approved in December 19. If you'll recall, we limited that increase to no more than the higher education price index of 2.4% uh, on our base designated tuition. So that's included in there and we are in line with that approved increase. Also, we have very conservative enrollment projections. Again, this varies across the institutions, across the colleges, and the different professional programs. State appropriation has a reduction of 2.7%, as I mentioned with regards to the uh, reduction issued by the state leadership. Grants and contracts increase a little bit by 1.7%. The majority of this is a reflection of the telepsychiatry program, Senate Bill 11. Um, the Regent Hammond worked tirelessly on the last session for that, so we appreciate his effort in that, and our budget does reflect that new program. Additional uh, cancer uh, funding and uh, some additional COVID-19 research projects. Professional fees at the Health Science Center is reduced about 1.2%, obviously due to the impact of the COVID disruption on our hospitals and our practice plans. And our biggest reduction of auxiliary enterprises due to the reduced occupancy in each one of those activities, including athletics, residence halls, hospitality, student union, and rec center. On the next page, is a detail of the expenditure categories reflective of the budget uh, income that we have identified. Just a couple of the variances on this page. Public service increased slightly. Again, that is the direct result of the telepsychiatry program from SB 11. We reported that in the income category, and this is the expenditure category. Institutional support, that's administrative faculty, I mean, sorry, that's administrative staff. We've implemented hiring freeze and soft hiring freezes, um, reduced travel, reduced non-essential expenditures, and that's a reduction of almost 10%. Scholarships and fellowships increased slightly uh, due to the increase in tuition set aside for need-based scholarships and increase in our federal financial aid programs. Our plant funds decreased substantially at 27%. Again, as we've mentioned, it's the delay in our minor construction projects. Uh, again, just being very cautious of, of not knowing the impact fully of the COVID-19. Uh, and then our auxiliary enterprises reduced about 5%. Again, with regards to the reduced capacity in all of those operations. So on the next page, Mr. Chairman, our recommendation is uh, $2,186,308,605. Um, it, it does reflect a $40 million reduction or about a 2%. Questions, comments? No, I have report members been briefed on this in detail. 
not, I hear a motion to approve item five as presented. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. The motion passes. Thank you. Mr. Barnes, please present item number six regarding the selection of primary deposit board. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the last uh, approval for this contract for our repository services was in 2014. This is just a natural process, timing-wise, that we're required to grab or competitive bid. On January the 8th, we did issue a request for proposals seeking um, institutions um, for our primary depository. We have five financial institutions respond to that. We had a very large 18, million, uh, 18 member um, evaluation team from all of the um, institutions. Uh, our recommendation is that um, the chance would be allowed to conclude negotiations and enter into a, an agreement with J.P. Morgan Chase Bank. J.P. Morgan Chase Bank is currently the um, primary depository advisor, so it does not change that relationship, but it will be a new contract. Any questions or comments for here on this item? If not, do I hear a motion to approve item six as presented? So moved. Second. A motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you. Ms. Barnes, please present item number seven regarding uh, update to the bond issues. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Back in May, the board approved and gave authority for us to go out with a revenue financing bond. Um, we uh, worked with all of the component institutions, uh, had very favorable ratings by Standard and Poor's and Moody. Um, these are not only really high ratings, but they also carry the um, tag of stable. Uh, and particularly in this environment, uh, I think we should be very proud that we were able to get this type of a rating. I'm sorry I don't see the PowerPoint presentation, but again, I think it's in um, the diligent. Um, the, the other thing I think that's important just to notice here is the ratings are based on a stress test. So what they do is they take, in this case, our $300 million bond, they run it through our FY19 financials before they apply the new revenue sources that would provide the debt service for this. So um, it's sort of a, a stress test based on um, your most current completed fiscal year without any additional revenue stream. So um, I think that just, again, is a very strong indication of our financial source. And it is a um, team effort by all of the institutions, the presidents, the CFOs, um, as we manage our, our financials with the institution, I think it just highlights that. Um, on the uh, next page in, in your presentation material, page three, it does detail the 314745000 bond issuance. You can see the specific projects. We also were able to include the minor projects in this bond issuance from the other institutions of 17.2 million and refinancing or refunding the 2012 A and B series. Um, that refunding saves $16.1 million or 16.5% net present value um, and reduced on average uh, the debt service by a million dollars. And page four in your material just shows the before and after debt service payment. Um, the nice thing is that uh, it doesn't change much, but we do have the um, bullet payment in 2040, which allows us to implement a monetization. So that's been very successful. On page five, um, really this is the highlight of our bond issuance. The uh, series 2020 taxable total cost um, of issuance was 2.51 percent um, and the um, average weighted yield on the outstanding bonds as of May was 3.25 percent after this uh, bond issuance the weighted average yield on our outstanding bonds is 2.97 percent a reduction of 8 percent in the total cost of capital 
So, Mr. Chairman, this is the update on our bond issues. Any questions for Gary regarding asylum? It's very good news. Thank you for John Boldon. Be nice if interest rates went up every once in a while. <laughs> Shame on you for even saying that. All right. Dr. Gallion, please present item number eight regarding appointments with tenure. Thank you, Regent Huckabee. Uh, we are requesting the granting of tenure to six faculty members who are being hired at the associate professor or professor rank. We begin their appointments on September 1st. Uh, we have one from the Rawls College of Business, one from Engineering, one from Arts and Sciences, and three from the School of Veterinary Medicine. All of these people have held tenured appointments at uh, previous institutions. And uh, the addition of these faculty members does not appreciably change our distribution of tenured faculty members uh, among the current faculty. Thank you. Are there any questions related to this item? If not, do I hear a motion to approve item A as presented? So moved. Second. A motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Rice Spearman, please present item nine regarding dual degree programs for the Master of Science in Nursing and Master of Business Administration. The presidents of Texas Tech University and the Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center recommend, and the chancellor concurs, that the Board of Regents approve a new dual degree program from two existing programs, a Master of Science in Nursing Administration within the HSC School of Nursing, and a Master of Business Administration with a concentration in Health Organization Management within the TTU Jerry S. Rolls College of Business Administration. The board further authorizes the submission by the HSC Vice Provost and TTU Vice Provost for institutional effectiveness to the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools Commission on Colleges to provide required notification of the program. This dual degree in MSN and Nursing Administration and MBA has been in existence for decades and there are several such programs in Texas. Uh, nurses who choose a healthcare administration route choose this route in order to be more competitive by having the clinical administration focus as well as the business administration graduate degree. We have requests for this degree, degree route every year and have had to turn away applicants to choose from other universities. We would expect around five to eight students per year for this dual degree track. TTU and TTU HSC have our, already had all the courses and faculty to make the program work and there is no expense necessary to create this dual, dual degree program. Any questions? Dr. Ross Spearman, in light of what appears to be a decline in the School of Nursing, do you see this as being a, a positive accent back towards bringing some, some students or program uh, changes that will enhance the enrollment there? Absolutely, Regent Gordon. We feel like this is an example of a collaborative innovation between the two universities and I think there's a great opportunity for us to build a moment. Any other questions? Seeing so none, do you hear motion to approve item nine as presented? So moved. A motion in a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you. Dr. Rice Spearman, please present item 10 regarding change in academic work. I recommend, and the Chancellor concurs, that the Board of Regents approve a change in academic rank effective September 1st for the faculty member listed below. I recently just presented to you Dr. Donna Seacrest, who will be serving as Dean of the School of Health Professions. She has gone and been vetted through the process to the school and the university, and we highly recommend her for this designation. Any questions? Do I hear a motion to approve item 10 as presented? A motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you. Dr. Rice Spearman, please present item 11 regarding the appointment of the Grover A. Murray Professorship. It is my pleasure to recommend, and the Chancellor concurs, that the Board of Regents approve the appointment of Dr. Stephen L. Burke as the Grover E. Murray Professor. I'd like to share a little bit of information with you about Dr. Burke. The Grover E. Murray Professorship is intended for faculty members who attain national and international distinction for outstanding research, scholarly, and creative achievement, and Dr. Burke meets all of those criteria. 
In 1999, Dr. Burke joined the faculty of the Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center. He held the positions of Regional Dean for the Emerald Campus, Professor of Medicine, and the Merrick Myers Endowed Chair in Geriatric Medicine. Dr. Burke was appointed Dean of the School of Medicine in 2006 and Executive Vice President in 2010. Dr. Burke graduated from Boston University School of Medicine and completed his Internal Medicine Residency and Infectious Disease Fellowship at Boston City Hospital. He is a member of Phi Beta Kappa, Alpha Omega Alpha, and Sigma Chi. Dr. Burke is the author and co-author of over 150 peer-reviewed publications and four textbooks. His publications have been cited 3,700 times, and he has an H index of 28. He has served on the NIH Special Advisory Panel on the Evaluation of Vaccines Against Infections in the Elderly, on the editorial board of the Journal of the American Geriatric Society, and is a reviewer for the most internal medicine and infectious disease journals. He has served on the board of directors nominating committee for the Association of American Medical Colleges and chaired the AAMC community-based dean subcommittee for eight years. Recently, both his editorials on wearing face masks and dealing with the issue of COVID-19 in nursing homes <coughs> circulated nationally by the AAMC. Dr. Burke has been recognized for many achievements throughout his distinguished career. His teaching ability was well recognized at East East Tip. Tennessee State University, where he received the Medical School's Teacher of the Year Award 10 times and the University's Distinguished Faculty Award. The American College of Physicians bestowed the title of Laureate in Medicine on Dr. Burke in 1998. He was elected to the National Board of Alpha Omega Alpha in 1999. In 2006, his memoir, entitled Anatomy of Kidnapping, was published by Texas Tech Press and received the 2011 Board of Reviews Book of the Year Award. In 2012, he was elected Distinguished Alumni by Boston University School of Medicine and had an endowed UMC chair named in his honor. In 2019, he received the Department of Medical Education Teaching Award for the Infectious Disease course. Through Dr. Burke's leadership, the School of Medicine has experienced continued growth of innovative ideas and programs. His personal vision for addressing the ever-increasing need for primary care physicians launched a unique family medicine accelerated track the first program of its kind in the nation. Other innovations include the creation of the Covenant Branch Campus for third and fourth year clerkship training, the Medical Student Barbershop Hypertension Program, Dean's Ambassadors, the Clinical Research Institute, creating the Department of Medical Education, and the Women's Health Research Institute of Amarillo, and the Lubbock Medical Student Lynn Free Clinic. The Grover E. Murray Professorship will be held for the remainder of the recipient's active service at the HSC. Holders of the title if granted emeritus status upon retirement shall be designated as Grover E. Murray Professor Emeritus. We have 12 faculty members who hold this distinction. Any questions regarding this? If not, do I hear a motion to approve that item 11 as presented? Motion. So I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Same sign. The motion carries. Thank you. Very well recognized, Honor. Thank you. Yeah. Mrs. Turner, please present item 12 regarding the approval of the 2021 audit plan. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. The first time we have is the annual audit plan for fiscal year 2021 to present for your approval. As you know, we uh, are statutory, statutorily required to follow two sets of audit standards. One of those, the Institute of Internal Audit uh, Standards for the Professional Practice of Internal Auditing, requires that we periodically review the definition of internal auditing with our board and with senior management. You see the definition here. Um, keywords, independent objective, um, talks about how we go about our work. Assurance and consulting activity is what we do. Um, our goal is to bring a systematic, disciplined approach to help our organizations improve risk management, control, and governance processes. It also requires reviewing the code of ethics that we follow. There are four principles and rules of conduct associated with each of these. Integrity, objectivity, confidentiality, and competency. 
In order to develop the annual plan each year, we go through a detailed and uh, very broad risk assessment process. Um, one of the cornerstones of that is obtaining risk information from the institutions and system administration. They have enterprise risk management processes in place, and we take that into account. We also do interviews with uh, dozens and dozens of individuals, including all the presidents, the chancellor, vice chancellors, vice presidents, and deans, um, and gather information in order to put this plan together. So here are some areas of focus in our 2021 audit plan. This is not a complete list. You'll see that under item one of the, of the materials that we sent out. But the areas of focus, uh, I've categorized those into three broad categories. First, financial resources. I've, done, I've set aside a, a pretty uh, high number of hours for COVID-related funding audits across all four of our universities. Um, they've all received CARES Act funding as well as additional funds from other sources, $45 million in federal funding and counting. Um, with additional federal funds coming soon to be allocated by the governor's office. Um, I've set aside 1,500 hours for this. By the way, this plan is based on 19,000 chargeable audit hours. Um, and I've, I've set aside about 3,500 hours for special projects and fraud investigations. That's, what I, that's about the amount I set aside each year. In addition um, to, to uh, COVID-related funding, you'll see construction project audits across all of our institutions, and then you see the Tech Foundation external audit that we have each year. Um, we're gonna be looking at the School of Veter Veterinary Medicine and the School of Dentistry state line, item, uh, state line items. We also have secret grant funds that have a required annual audit that's performed externally. Um, I'm not going to mention everything here. Certified Cost Rehabilitation Report, Weeks Halt, and I need to add the Dairy Barn as well. Those are historic buildings, and um, through a process, TTU can obtain a tax credit for that, which Noel handles, and they can sell those on the market. Those require a, us to certify that those costs were incurred and in associate, in, associated with those projects, so we'll be doing that for those too. At the Health Sciences Center, we'll be looking at the Lubbock Department of Otolaryngology, um, ear, nose, and throat. That department is relatively new. A couple of years ago, it split off from the Department of Surgery here in Lubbock, so we'll be looking at that department for the first time. We had hoped to get to Amarillo this year, the fiscal 2020 plan. We did not make it up there, so I'm carrying that forward to do some work on that campus as well. Uh, residency grants, we look at those on uh, as required by the coordinating board each year at both of our health sciences centers. In addition, we've got Polo Foster School of Medicine Financial Review that we're going to be doing this year. And then at Angelo State, we're going to do a, a consulting engagement in their institutional advancement office, as well as having the external audits done of the CAR Foundation and ASU Foundation financial statements. Next category is information technology, IT audits. Um, at the system administration, we're going to do an IT general controls review. This is a foundational uh, project that we do periodically at each of our universities. System administration, information technology group, information systems group, they manage the banner uh, suite of products, the enterprise-wide systems that our institution uses <coughs> for um, financial, HR, and student um, at three of our universities. They manage those. So we're going to do that foundational audit there. At TTU, we'll be looking at IT change management processes. In other words, the processes they go through to change uh, applications and systems. Do a little bit of work in architecture. It's a management advisory engagement to help them with their IT resources. And then at three of our universities, we'll be looking at payment card industry data security standard compliance. So these are the credit card standards that you're required to follow if you're a merchant that accepts. American Express, uh, Visa, MasterCard, etc. Those compliance requirements impact both our IT um, uh, environment in which those networks sit and then also um, out in the areas that accept credit cards like the colleges, the clinics, and our health sciences centers, athletics, and other places. Um, we did some work this last year that, that touched on PCI at ASU, so I did not include an ASU audit of that. In addition, I've got um, El Paso, we have IT governance, and then we're gonna um,
do a project implementation review of the dental electronic health record. So they acquired Axiom, which I understand is a commonly used dental EHR system, and um, we're going to be uh, working with them on that implementation. And then the final category, op operational and compliance work. At all of our universities each year, we have to look at contracting and procurement processes that's required by Senate Bill 20. Um, and we're going to be doing that this upcoming year. Every three years, there's a statutory requirement to look at multi-hazard emergency plan safety and security. That will happen in fiscal 21, again, for all of our institutions. At TTU, we have athletics on the plan every year. Every year we do something um, in their athletics compliance office, as well as potentially financial or operational work. Um, at two of our universities, we're going to be looking at international student visa processes. Um, foreign influence is a very hot topic right now in higher education and academic medicine. Um, this is one process that impacts that. There are federal regulations required um, that we're required to follow with international students. We're going to look at those processes at TTU and at TTU Health Sciences Center. The coordinating board periodically requires a facilities audit. It's a space audit, basically, to be sure that we're reporting the use of space correctly to them. We help out with that, and we'll be doing that the coming year. Um, at the Health Sciences Center, in addition to the ones I've already talked about, the Correctional Managed Healthcare contract requires that we do some audit work each year. So you see that on here. I'm going to talk in a minute about student financial aid program audits across the system. Um, in brief, El Paso, because it's new to issuing its own uh, aid under its own federal ID number, does have to undergo some external audits of that. Um, Medical Practice Income Plan Business Office. This is the office through which all the revenue for the practice plan in El Paso, uh, the medical clinics in El Paso flows through. So we're going to do some operational work in there. And then at Angelo State, their Title IX uh, administrator asked us if we could do some work with her in athletics around Title IX and gender equity plans that they have there. Um, that will be a management advisory combination with compliance work. And then we'll be looking at student billing processes, in other words, tuition fees, room and board, and then looking at financial compliance and internal research grants as well. This is not an exhaustive list, but it does uh, hit most of what we have on the plan this year. The entire uh, list is under tab one and will be on our website a little bit later today. And with that, we respectfully request your approval of this year's audit plan. Any questions related to I'll hear your motion to approve by as well as presented. So moved. Second. A motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Ms. Stern, please present item 13 regarding reports on audits. Thank you. I wanted to make some comments today on student financial aid. It is such a key area across our institutions. I know it's one that the board and senior leaders at all of our institutions is focused on as well. I have some statistics here. Maybe you could move your window up a little bit. Um, the grand total in the bottom right for 2019-20 academic year student financial aid and scholarships across our institution is almost $531 million. Um, that represents it equates to about one fourth of the dollars that you just approved in the in the uh, budget for the system. That's how much money flows through there, through, flows through the student financial aid offices and the universities on an annual basis. This does not include CARES Act funding, by the way. There's another about 17 million this year in CARES Act funding that our uh, student financial aid offices have administered. Student financial aid is considered an inherently high risk area in the higher education environment. Um, this is for two reasons. First of all, the dollars that we talked about, you see how much money is flowing through. 60% of that, by the way, is federal funding. And all federal funding, we know, comes with significant strings attached and requirements in place. In addition, the complexity of compliance is very high. Um, all sources of student financial aid, whether they're state, federal, or donor-based, or other institutional, come with strings attached. The U.S. Department of Education Handbook is uh, covering student financial aid, which is issued annually and changes annually, is almost 1,500 pages long. 
and that's just for the federal aid. The DOE has also been known to change federal aid policies even in the middle of the year. The state also has financial aid that is administered at the state level. Those also have uh, regulations that can change periodically. And finally, whenever we have uh, donor-based scholarships, which we have a lot of, those uh, often come with restrictions as to majors, GPAs, et cetera. While federal and state awarding is generally centralized in each of our university's student financial aid office, scholarships are administered through a combination approach. Some scholarships, for example, presidential merit scholarships are administered by the student financial aid office. Um, likewise with athletic scholarships, they work with athletics, obviously. There are a number of, of uh, scholarships, though, that are administered by the colleges, departments, and schools. Um, those are primarily pertaining to specific programs of study. Audits of state and federal aid are regularly performed by state or federal auditors. State auditors' office made a significant change in their statewide coverage of financial aid a few years ago. Until 2017, the State Auditor's Office audited federal student financial aid cluster for the entire state of Texas annually. TTU was always included in that, so we got some really good coverage at Texas Tech University. And then those, those findings were always communicated to the other universities as well. With the student financial aid cluster declining in proportion to other federal programs administered by the state, like Medicare Medicaid, and because the annual audit was not identifying systemic statewide non-compliance or weaknesses, the student financial aid cluster is now only subject to audit every three years. This means that while SAO will include TTU every three years, they will rarely include our other institutions, and if so, it's on an every three-year basis. So we have a multifaceted approach to audit coverage in this key area. For scholarships, our office routinely audits scholarship processes at the institutions during audits of colleges, schools, and departments. An example of this is in your is in your book under tab nine, the Health Sciences Center School of Nursing Audit. We did cover scholarship processes in that one. It's an example we, we cover this often. We also did a management advisory engagement early this year to provide information uh, related to underutilized scholarship endowment accounts at Texas Tech University, uh, which they've been implementing changes in. For state grant programs, like the Texas Grant Program, the Coordinating Board will audit some of those. They require us to audit other ones. And then for federal aid, the State Auditor's Office covers that um, using federal regulations. This year, for Texas Tech University system, audit coverage includes the following. At Angelo State, there's item two in your board book is an audit that our office did. Um, it was really in depth and, and we appreciate um, some information that we received from Texas A&M that helped us really pursue this in an efficient way. Um, Texas A&M developed analytics, and they shared those with us, data analytics. They use Banner just like we do, and so those analytics could be applied in our environment as well. It allowed us to audit thousands of transactions efficiently instead of just small samples as we have uh, periodically done in the past. We're going to continue to refine these analytics and use them across the institutions. At TTU, we just... Uh, uh, had a program on it by Baker Tilly, which is a, a CPA, national CPA and uh, advisory firm that has a large hiring practice. It's out of three in your board book. This audit covered federal aid, but the same processes are used in state aid, and so we get comfort on all of those kinds of aid. The results were really positive, and um, in addition to that at TTU, State Auditor's Office has already started the work of the fiscal 2020 audit that includes student financial aid for federal at the Health Sciences Center, Baker Tilly is doing the same audit there. They're almost finished. We have a draft report that indicates good results, and we should have a final report in the next couple of weeks. And finally, El Paso, because academic year 2019-20 is the first year that El Paso issued financial aid under its own federal ID, there will be a series of audits required. Prior to this, Health Sciences Center was handling financial aid for El Paso as well as TTUHSC. Um, we've hired the CPA firm of Belt Harris Pahachik, which is the same firm that did the financial statement audits required by SACS at El Paso. They have already uh, understanding of their control environment, so should not have to start at square one. Our, audit, our office is doing a foundational audit right now in El Paso in student financial aid, looking at policies and procedures, certain internal controls, 
and following up on recommendations of the Department of Education review done earlier this year to help them prepare for these external audits. In addition to these audit efforts, the directors of financial aid at our institutions have frequent communications with each other, with their counterparts in Texas and throughout uh, the country through their national organization. They stay very plugged in, which helps them understand changes in regulations, areas of frequent non-compliance and other key risks, and we have developed solid working relationships with them to help address this key area. The one other thing I wanted to cover, um, the board gives us a lot of latitude in our annual audit planning process and throughout the year as risks change, sometimes we either cancel audits or add audits. We had a few that we canceled this year really because of changing risks. Um, these decisions were made inside of our office. We were not you know, asked or told to cancel these. These are um, TTU, uh, an IT controls compliance review that was actually done externally. TTU college reserve balances, HSC El Paso physical plant, HSC mental health institute, and ASU online giving processes were canceled. We did not add any risk-based audits to our plan, and that concludes my report. Ms. Turner, Ms. Wright, what does the Carr Foundation stand, do they administer their own scholarships or does it flow through student aid? It does, it does flow through student aid. It is, it's like any other outside entity. They, um, they give us their money. We okay. So, so, Kim, that's how the, the audit flows through to the Carr Foundation is really on the student aid basis. Well, the audit is looking at the assets, expenditures, et cetera, of the Carr Foundation. The Carr Foundation essentially writes a check to the to the university. So the Carr Foundation external audit does not include donor compliance, making sure that um, they're choosing students in accordance with their policies. That would be something we could do, um, but the external audit does not look at that. External audit just see, sees okay, you wrote a check to the university. Okay, so it would be ASU's responsibility if there was discrepancies in the scholarship donations, for example, or the grants that were made if they weren't, if they were in error or something yes. like that. Those are all administered by the Student Financial Aid Office, car okay. scholarships and others. As okay, well. thank you. Other questions? Mr. Turner, have you been able to do the things that you need to do considering the pandemic and quarantine? So you know, we are really fortunate in our office. I think um, our staff transitioned almost seamlessly to working from home. We all have laptops. Um, only our administrative assistant does not have a laptop. And we all have university laptops. We all went home. About day three, we ordered an additional monitor, travel monitor for each person. So we had dual monitors we could work from. Um, there were a few things we couldn't do, like cash controls observation, things like that. When the campus is closed, there's an inventory piece that we need to go find some pieces of equipment at TTU. We can do that now that the university is reopening. But for the most part, we were able to continue our work. Um, so much of what we do, we're able to do electronically and remotely. We had meetings, uh, entrance conferences, exit conferences, etc., with our clients via Zoom and Skype and Teams. So um, our work was not heavily impacted by COVID. There were some traveling that we couldn't do that we would have done, um, but we were able to stay very productive over the summer. Good. Any other questions? Mr. Turner, can I make a comment, please? Yes, sir. I'm I, I said it before, I'll say it again. Uh, Kim and her crew are the eyes and ears of this board and this university. Uh, we are a far flung operation, and we uh, are made up of millions of systems and procedures that allow us to work on a daily basis and have everything run the way it's supposed to be run. And Kim and her crew serve as our eyes and ears to check and make sure that the uh, uh, systems and procedures are being followed as they should be. And she does a great job, her people do a great job, and we owe them a big debt of gratitude. Thank you, Regent Hammonds. I have an awesome staff, and they, I mean, they, they're awesome. I can't say enough about them. Thank you. Kim, I think that's a great way to end. Right? It is. So thank you. Um, Quit while you're ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, next, we'll approve the items on the consent agenda, agenda and the knowledge review information agenda as well. All
called upon Vice Chairman Lewis to preside over those matters. Mr. Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Hutton. The committee as a whole. Um, the item is consideration of the consent agenda items A through Y is listed on pages 1 through 37 in the agenda book, and the information agenda items from 1 through 7 is listed on pages 38 through 42. Is there any discussion of the items either in the consent or information agendas? As a reminder, if there's an item that you would like to discuss further in detail or vote separately from the consent agenda, you may request that item to be removed to be moved to the committee of the whole agenda. Any discussion? Mr. Chairman, I move that the board approve the consent agenda and acknowledge its review of the information agenda. Second. Heard the motion. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say sign. Motion carries. Mr. Mr. Chairman, this concludes the items to be considered by the committee of the whole at this time. Thank you, Regent Lewis. The board will now convene into executive session as authorized by sections 551.071, 551.072, 551.073, 551.074, 551.075, 551.076, 551.077, 551.078, 551.079, 551.078, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 551.079, 
Please present the motions regarding items discussed. In understanding between Texas Tech University, Sisling, and Midwestern State University that will become operative if legislation is passed by the 87th legislature regarding Midwestern State University as a component institution within the Texas Tech University system under the terms and conditions set forth in the executive session. Heard the motion, may I have a second? Second. I have a second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Regent Lewis. Motion number two, to authorize contract modifications for presidential contracts. Having determined that contract extensions with the presidents of the Texas Tech University Health Science Center at El Paso and Texas Tech University are in the best interest of the institutions, and due to the exemplary performance and confidence the Board of Regents has in their leadership, I move that the Chancellor would be authorized to offer and execute contract extensions with Dr. Richard Lyon and Dr. Lawrence Skownick under the terms and conditions set forth in the executive session. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Regent Lewis. Chairman, there's no action of any kind to be taken on the remaining items posted for and discussed in the executive session. I would just like to make a quick statement to say we've just made two motions that are very important to the future of Texas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All of you. Worked on both of those. Very, very important motions. Final item of business is announcements that come before the board. And the only thing I'd like to say is thanks to all of you. We've got some tough work in front of us. We've had some tough work behind us. Uh, it's not going to be perfect, but it's going to be OK. All right? We just got to put our heads down and get our work done. So thanks to all of you for the work you're doing. Uh, thanks for all of you for the work you're about to do. So uh, let's get after it. we got work to do. So thank you for your time. Thank you for the time today in the meeting. I think it was a very successful meeting. Do I have a, here a motion to adjourn the meeting? No vote. Second. Second. Meeting of the Board of Regents of the Texas Tech University stands adjourned. Would you repeat all that by heart?